So, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming along. Um, usual housekeeping first. Um, there are no fire alarms planned during this session. Um, if uh, a fire alarm should go off, that means it's therefore serious. Fire exits are straight across. I think the, the nearest fire exit is straight across. Um, follow that. There is a full fire drill and evacuation of the building planned at 2 p.m. So my recommendation is we're going to finish at 1. Um, so I'm just going to take that we're going to finish at 1 and have lunch. I would strongly recommend that we all get the heck out of here before 2 o'clock so we don't get caught up in a mass building evacuation and blah, 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 because um, that would be no fun. So, um, but during the session, nothing is planned. So if anything should happen, um, I'm going to be nervous if not terrified. Um, Lou's gents and ladies are down that way. Ladies first, then gents at the end, past the stairs. Um, it's a standard Innovate UK event, so I'm going to say it again. I always say it. The queue for the la ladies is going to be significantly shorter than the queue for the gents. Um, and if we can even things out uh, over time so that we get more diversity and innovation, people thinking in different ways for whatever reason, whether it be for which loo they use or anything else, that would be brilliant because we like diversity and innovation because it brings more to the party. So we'll keep going on that. Um, other housekeeping things. Um, if you could keep your questions until the Q&A session, that would be much appreciated because then we can get a microphone to you and the people online on the webinar um, will hear the question as well, which will make it a lot easier. And for those online who have questions, if you can type them in, um, colleagues from the Innovate UK team, Emily um, is uh, looking after that in particular. Um, and other than that, I think that's all the housekeeping. I can't remember what else I meant to say. Um, agenda. Um, I'm going to talk to you about sort of the story of innovation loans, where they are, how they fit um, within the context of things, how the blah, 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 how it usually works. Then you're going to hear some, from some real people. So we have some borrowers on the panel. Um, we have uh, Tim Murley, who's our, our new um, interim chief investment officer, going to be joining the panel. Um, Rod uh, from UK BAA is going to moderate that because you're going to be bored of my voice by then. We'll break then for a cup of coffee or tea or banana milkshakes if you're at home on the webinar. Um, then you're going to hear from Ian Tracy from the Knowledge Transfer Network who's going to talk about writing a good project application. And then Scott O'Brien, our head of lending operations and risk, is going to talk about how we think about credit when we're thinking about is this a cool project, is this a sensible business, What the, is this a sensible business, it looks like I'm going to wrap up reminding you of um, hopefully the basics of how to apply, how to apply properly um, in order to have the best chance of success. And then we should be done by 1 o'clock um, in time for um, networking lunch and out of the building before 2. Um, please, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask. But please go through our nice people um, in Swindon. Um, our customer support services team. But before you do that, please read the instructions. Yeah, I, we spent a lot of time writing them. Um, we hope that they will be helpful and will explain the core things that you need to understand. If you need additional clarification, please get in touch, ideally through the um, customer support services team, because they will hound me down until I reply, and which I have to do within two days. Um, and uh, hopefully that will make life easy for you. So please read the instructions. It's really important. Um, and we won't, I'm afraid, be able to offer you advice because that would be outside of the scope of what we're doing. We're not a financial advisor. I'd love you to get expert advice around your accounts, for example. The financials are really, really important around the legal side of things, around the technology yeah. side of things. So is anybody not familiar with Innovate UK? OK, normally one hand goes up and I can make a joke around this is just for you. Um, so anyway, you know Innovate UK. We're the UK's innovation agency. Our role is to stimulate business-led innovation because that drives productivity and growth in the UK economy. We do that in a couple of ways. Um, sorry, the reason we do that is that growth in the economy. So it's not about can we put money into things. It's can we put money into things, stimulate, support, make you do more things, help your businesses to grow, because that's what grows the economy. The 70,000 jobs that are created or have been created over the past 10 years with our support is not because we've created jobs, it's because you have. And we want to help support, stimulate that to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do or significantly accelerate those things. 
And we do it in a couple of ways. We do it through connections, we do it through funding. People typically think, oh, Innovate UK, the nice people who hand out free money. Um, connections are really, really important. So please um, connect with the Knowledge Transfer Network, connect with the Enterprise Europe Network, connect with those catapult centers, and make the most of connecting with other people, with experts with, around technology, around location, around um, markets. Um, and then if you need money, then think about the money side of things. How do we fund? Typically in, in, in two broad ways. One way is challenge-led. So the government has identified specific challenges in the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, significant societal economic challenges um, that will um, represent significant opportunities globally, not just in the UK for you. But the timing and content and typically the need for collaboration in those competitions doesn't work for everybody. So we have an open program as well, SMART, which is brilliant for finding and proving a new idea, just as the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is brilliant for collaborating across supply chains and in disrupting industries. SMART is um, uh, based on your challenge, uh, and we ask you to define that and come back to us, um, and hopefully that works. And we're doing some pilots, and Innovation Loans is one of those pilots. So these are the um, industrial strategy challenges. As I said, significant societal and economic challenges. Entire industries being transformed and disrupted. We're running lots of competitions, big ones, small ones, early ones, late ones, centers, all sorts of really cool stuff. Please look online and see whether you might fit into that um, in order to connect in with other people, whether it's researchers or large businesses and see whether you can help to deliver on those. And because they're big societal and economic challenges, we think they're big opportunities for growth for businesses that have technology innovation that's going to help to address those. Um, as I said, SMART is for businesses in any sector. Um, it's open effectively on a rolling basis. You say what the challenge is. You say why your technology or innovation is addressing that challenge. You tell us about your market opportunity. Um, and if we think it's a really good project, um, then we'll look to offer grant funding. It's highly competitive. Um, so please be aware of that um, if you're considering applying. And then we have innovation loans. Innovation loans want to do exactly the same things as all those other things I've talked about. We want to grow the economy. We want to stimulate. We want your businesses to grow because that drives the impact that we're looking for. And because it's a loan, we hope that we'll make taxpayers' funding work harder and go further and help you in, in a slightly different way. Um, so we're running a pilot program. We have completed five competitions in the initial pilot, committed 50 million pounds um, across 73 borrowers. Um, we have an extension to that pilot that we're running at the moment. We just closed one competition. We've got another one that's open now, which this briefing event is all about. Um, and our objective is to help you to grow your business for later stage research and development activities for small and medium-sized businesses with a clear route to commercial success um, who are credit constrained and need public sector funding to help. And in return for us being able to provide you with up to 100% of your project costs covered, um, you pay us some interest and you repay the loan. And hopefully, because you're really good, good and going to grow, that's going to fit your funding strategy. Um, and I'm really pleased that in this slide, we can have um, this piece of it that says we're award-winning. Woo! Uh, Joe, who's going to be on the panel, is also award-winning, as is Tang, who's going to be on the panel. But Joe didn't have to apply for, uh, nominate herself for the award. Um, anyway, uh, innovation loans, what are we trying to do? We're trying to offer particularly flexible and patient finance for that later stage of R&D. So it's just for single companies. Um, we can't fund a consortium. It's just too complicated. Um, we offer a rate of interest that is below market. In the original pilot, it was 3.7%, which was um, uh, dirt cheap. Um, significantly below market. This 7.4% is still, we believe, for the sort of projects that you're doing, for the sort of businesses you are at this time for what you want to do, significantly below what the market would charge um, for that. And we've structured the interest rate in such a way that um, it's sort of back-ended. 3.7% payable um, currently, 3.7% deferred until the end of the um, project period, and then added in, not compounded, but added into the principal, and 
uh, repaid over time and uh, with 7.4%. Um, it could last up to 10 years, um, and that's structured as some time to draw down the project fund, uh, the, the, the loan to fund your R&D costs, um, some time to get to the market, what we call an extension period, and then a repayment period. So it could be three years, up to two years, up to five years, making it up to 10 years long. We haven't done any 10-year loans. We've, we've done a few nine and a half years. Um, on average, borrowers um, in our initial pilot of the first five competitions, um, the loan period was around about seven years. So a couple of years of that R&D phase, a year or so of getting into the market, the pre-commercial activity, and around four years of repayment. Um, we can fund between £100,000 and a million pounds to fund the eligible project costs of a later stage research and development project. That's all we're permitted to fund. Um, and I can bore you with the state aid reasons for that in, uh, uh, over time, but think about it. This is funding the R&D element, um, later stage R&D that we classify as um, experimental development in accordance with state aid rules. And I have got a slide all about experimental development that I really like and nobody else does. Um, so we can lend between 100,000 pounds and a million pounds. On average, in our initial pilot, people borrowed about 700,000 um, pounds. And what are we looking for? We're looking for businesses that are highly innovative, that are doing something that's um, that's probably beyond my co comprehension, something that's risky. Um, we want you to be growth-oriented. Um, my colleagues in, no, I shouldn't make that rude joke because we're on, um, on a webinar and it's recorded, um, but we really want to see that growth side of things. Um, and I can be rude about grant junkies who perhaps just want free money rather than the growth opportunity. I really, really like growth opportunities. And we as a credit committee are particularly keen on growth opportunities. Um, it's probably more for businesses that are sort of at the scale up -y sort of stage rather than the start up -y sort of stage, in inverted commas. And I haven't defined either of those terms in this slide. In what I've said, it's not defined in the guidance. We'd like you to demonstrate to us why you're suitable to take on a long-term loan commitment. And if you're a brand new company, you might want to think hard about whether it's suitable to borrow you know, a million pounds over 10 years if you haven't yet raised any capital. That's going to be a tricky one. Um, if you're so scaling up that you're actually, you know, turning over 100 million pounds and you've got 250 employees um, and you're super duper, you probably ought to be talking to a bank um, because you're probably not credit constrained. Or if you are, it's not for reasons necessarily of your innovation. Um, it's perhaps for other reasons. Um, as I said, it's got to be late stage R&D, experimental <coughs> development, clear route to commercial success. And as I said, we're looking for risk, particularly interested in innovation risk because we're the UK's innovation agency. Um, we will have a, a, a credit risk appetite that goes beyond um, that of a typical commercial lender because we're not a commercial lender. Um, but we want to see that balance between innovation um, and credit risk. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the, how the loan is structured. Up to three years in the availability period when you're drawing down the funds quarterly in advance, spending it on your R&D, um, us charging you interest at 3.7% at the end of each quarter on the amount outstanding, and 3.7% deferred um, each quarter. Then once that's complete, there can be an extension period of up to two years, or whichever comes earlier, the period that you've agreed with us or your first commercial sale, if you're make, uh, relating to that project. If you're making commercial sales from stuff other than the project, then that's great. We're very happy to see that. You probably are as well, because it's a good thing to do to generate revenues. Um, if you're um, uh, making pre-commercial sales in relation to your project, if you're testing the market, if you're understanding the business model, if it's not yet properly commercial, then that will still work as well. Once you get into the commercial period, then the extension period needs to end. And then the repayment period starts, which could be as long as five years. It's whatever you've agreed with us. Um, and whereas in the availability and the extension periods, um, it's interest only with 3.7% payable each quarter on the amount outstanding and 3.7% deferred. In the repayment period, that deferred interest is added on to the principal and then the, the, the amount of the principal and the deferred interest together are repayable over the, over the repayment period with interest at 7.4%. And if by then 
you think 7.4% looks actually quite expensive because you're so successful and you wish to refinance, um, we don't charge early repayment fees. So actually, we'd probably quite like to be feeding the bank market at that point because you will have demonstrated that traction, that credibility, that ability to go out and borrow commercially, hopefully more cheaply, which is better for your business, gets our money back to the taxpayer more quickly, um, and things move along. As I've said, um, between £100,000 and a million pounds for the eligible project costs only. So not for sales and marketing, not for working capital. Um, uh, I've talked about the interest rate. Um, it's not an unsecured loan. Um, we don't take personal guarantees from directors because we know you hate that. Um, and we don't think it's appropriate because we're a public sector uh, lender. But we are managing public money. We do need to be responsible. Um, so we look to take a mortgage debenture over the overall assets of your business, a fixed and floating charge. And um, I would encourage you to talk to a lawyer about exactly what that means or exactly what the consequences are because it's really, really important. Um, and we would look to take a specific charge over assets that you purchase and or IP, the intellectual property that you develop with the proceeds of the loan. So we've lent to one company that's in the um, autonomous uh, aerial vehicles market um, and they bought a helicopter. It was a second-hand helicopter. Um, if... Um, and we have a charge over that. So if they were, unfortunately, to fail, we would have um, a second-hand helicopter, um, which would be great. We could um, try and find a bor borrower for it. Because they're working on um, autonomous, um, unmanned vehicles with their helicopter, it might have crashed a bit before then. I don't know. They're, they're probably really, really good, so it won't have done. Um, but that's the sort of thing. Um, and we will have covenants. So you will make promises to us in the loan agreement saying that you will and will not do certain things. You will promise to have uh, a monitoring officer come and check up on the project progress every quarter. You will promise to us to provide us with financial information every quarter so that our credit team can be sure that you are still a sensible borrower, that things aren't going off track from a financial point of view. You will um, promise not to uh, change control over your business without our prior consent. And if you suddenly get taken over by a massive conglomerate, that's probably really good for your business, um, but not what innovation loans are there for. They're just for SMEs who are credit constrained. So at that point, I would imagine we would say, congratulations, well done. Have a great time with as part of that fantastic big business. But in advance, please, could you repay the loan and then carry on um, as you would have done uh, otherwise. So those covenants, it's all the, at the back of this slide deck, um, which will be made available to everybody through the nice people at the Knowledge Transfer Network um, on SlideShare. Um, you can see a summary of those loan terms and conditions. Um, it's also on the uh, Innovate UK Innovation Funding Service website, um, where the summary terms and conditions are in the terms and conditions. Um, I'm going to sort of skip this slide very quickly, but one of the things I wanted to say these are meant to be complementary to grants. I want you to be thinking, we want you to be thinking about your technology development strategy. And most people that come along to an innovation, uh, Innovate UK briefing event really do understand their technology development strategy. They're probably very, very clever technologists. We also really want you to be thinking about your commercialization strategy. Because if you're going to grow, if you're going to grow your business, generate revenues, generate profits, generate cash flows in order to be able to repay the loan, you need to have thought about your, your commercialization strategy. And underpinning those two, enabling those two, is your funding strategy. And we hope that innovation loans may fit with your funding strategy. If it does, we'd love to see an application. If it doesn't, then I hope you find an alternative because we're not the only game in town. There are lots of other things out there and the panel will talk about them. Um, so please think about that. Um, this is a form of state aid because the interest rate is below market because we're not charging fees. Uh, we, we don't have arrangement fees. We don't have monitoring fees. We don't have early repayment fees. We don't take warrants or equity kickers or all of that sort of nice stuff. Um, nice for... I don't know, venture debt lenders or people like that. So because of that, it's a form of state aid. It's a form of state aid offered by Innovate UK under our notified scheme for state aid for research and development and innovation activities under Article 25 of the General Block Exemption Regulations in the State Aid Framework, which is why it's only eligible costs 
eligible project costs for a late stage R&D project. There are consequences to it being state aid that you should be thinking about in relation to R&D tax credits, for example. Um, uh, so please think about that. If you're not sure about how that all works, please take expert advice because um, we don't want you doing the wrong thing. Um, I think I've talked about all the other bits and pieces on there. So how does it work? Um, this is a pilot program, and we this is now our seventh competition in the pilot, and we've been changing things as we go along in order to test, because that's what pilots do. Um, in this particular competition, we're putting in a significant change uh, to the way in which people apply. In the past, we had that dreadful FTP site, um, which nobody likes. Um, then um, we changed the front end part slightly. In this competition, your project application is done through the Innovation Funding Service of Innovate UK online, hopefully a much better user experience for you as you apply. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that works. And Ian Tracy is going to talk about advice on how to put together a really good project application. You have to complete, uh, actually it's 11 questions. 10 of them are the 10 questions that everyone's familiar with. And we've given an additional question, which is, um, what's your business plan? Um, if you would like to upload a copy of your business plan um, that, or, or a pitch deck or something like that, then you're welcome to do so. So uh, question 11 is not scored. There are 10 scored questions. Ian's going to go through them. But it's fundamentally, you know, why are you doing this? Are you actually going to deliver? And you have to complete information about the financial aspects of your project. What are you going to spend the money on in the availability period? The labor, the materials, the overheads, the capital, capital equipment usage, um, et cetera. Um, that's part A around the project. The other part is around your business. And for the second time in this competition, uh, in this competition extensions, we're teaming up with Early Metrics. Uh, and they have a basic business survey um, using their high growth startup index survey, which is information about your business. Um, what markets are you going after? Where do you expect to see yourself in a few years' time? What, who are your shareholders? What's your capital structure look like? Why are you borrowing, looking to borrow this money um, within an overall business context? And business financials. We want to see not just um, some historic financials, which I hope you will have, or management accounts if you've only, if you're relatively recently formed and don't have filed accounts. We want to see more than just what you might file at Companies House, which is very much abbreviated, um, but still fairly simple financials. And we want to see the forecasts for the full period over which you're borrowing money. Um, I've been having a, a, a nice email conversation with a particular applicant who said, um, why have you said that I'm ineligible? And I said, well, you're ineligible because you did not provide any financial forecasts. And this person said, yeah, but I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I may as well just stick my finger in the air. And I don't think that's suitable or appropriate. And it's definitely ineligible if they're looking to borrow up to a million pounds over up to 10 years. You need to be certain for yourselves that it's sensible to do that. And if you haven't thought to the future, sure, that things are going to change in the future, but have some sensible assumptions tell us what those are and some forecasts based on those assumptions, and we know that things will change. But if you haven't thought about it, then that's scary from your point of view and from our point of view because we're lending taxpayers money. So on the early metrics survey point of view, you need to complete the survey um, to tell us about your business, answer some questions there, um, and complete the business financials. Both of those things must, I repeat, must, be completed and uploaded and have been submitted by 12 noon on the deadline day. 12.01 is late, I'm afraid. So I'm having another email conversation about someone who said, yeah, but it was 12.01. Couldn't you have had the whatever it is I put then sort of nearly there around 11.59? No, 12 o'clock is the deadline. Not where had you got to by 12 o'clock, but completed, submitted by 12. Anything that comes in later, I'm sorry, but it's ineligible because we have to treat thousands of applicants across many, many competitions that Innovate UK does fairly, impartially, and consistently. So 12 noon is the deadline. Um, uh, eligible submissions will then go out in really in two, in two 
different, uh, first of all, we'll check to make sure that it is, is eligible, i.e. did you actually submit all four of those parts? Sadly, quite a lot of people don't, and it really irritates me, because they've wasted their time. Um, not so worried about wasting my time, um, but their time does worry me. So if it's in scope and eligible, then part A goes off to our independent technical and commercial assessors, and they will score it around the quality of the innovation project. Not how cool is your tech, but is it a good project overall? Part B, and indeed part A, go to our credit team who do some initial triage. Is this hopelessly implausible, way too good to be considered, um, should go to the bank market, or actually, yeah, this fits within the um, framework, then if it's innovative, we'll take it forward for detailed credit analysis where we will kick the tires. And we will let you know um, within a particular time frame um, that I'll come to in a second, um, whether it fits. If it progresses, we'll do more detailed credit analysis. We'll talk to you. Um, it might be one of our credit team comes out and sees you. Maybe it's just on the phone, over email, whatever's most suitable and appropriate. And then comes back to the credit committee. And if we want to make a loan offer, we will do so. Um, and then goes through the diligence, pro uh, well, the documentation process in particular. We have a standard loan agreement template. Um, hopefully, you'll agree with that very easily. Um, you might want to ask us some questions about it. It's a template. We've done 73 of them already. We think it works, um, but hopefully that will work. And then meet the conditions, and then off you go with your project. We'll explain how that works in a bit. Um, some key dates, 27th of November at noon. Please don't apply 27th of November at 12.02, because the answer will be sorry but no. Um, no one, almost no one, will submit on the 20th of November. That's way too early. You'll all do it in the last two hours. Um, and we have data to prove that. I've got a slide at the very end that will show that. Um, we will then commit to come back to you to say either, thank you, but this doesn't work, um, because either it's not met the eligibility, uh, the, the innovation criteria, or maybe it hasn't met our initial credit criteria, or both, um, or we'll say to you, and we're taking you forward now to um, detailed credit analysis. And I hope that projects will be in a position to start drawing down, having completed their documentation, having met any conditions that are in the loan agreement, um, by sort of April, May 2020, I think is, it, based on prior experiences, when it's likely to start happening. Um, and just to let people know how things worked out in the um, uh, initial pilot, people are often, often say, what's the chance of success? This shows you what the chances of success, success are. In those first five competitions that we ran, 393 applications, 68 of them didn't complete the forms properly, or were late, or were applying for a completely different world. Um, so sadly, they didn't get any further. Um, it's a real shame. So 325 went out for detailed assessment by our independent technical and commercial assessors and an initial credit review by our team. And of those, 205 um, didn't basically cross the bar as to where they needed to be. So sadly, they weren't right for us or we weren't right for them. Um, 120 were progressed to detailed credit analysis. Um, we made 88 loan offers, and we've um, got 73 loans that are either complete or in final documentation or a couple still just meeting the final conditions, um, which committed the £50 million that we had available. Um, so you can pick, take your choice as to is it, is it you know, 120 out of 325 or is it 73 out of 393, but that's roughly speaking where we were in the, um, in the pilot competition. We haven't yet had to ration in terms of demand. Um, but the reason we have a competitive process is that if we get, um, I don't know, 200 applications looking for 200 million pounds and they all look pretty plausible, we've only got 25 million pounds available for this extension, two competitions, so that's probably 12 and a half million pounds in each one. If we have oversubscription, which we haven't had so far, then we will need to ration and we will take into account the innovation quality, credit suitability, and the nature of our portfolio. We don't want them all in, I don't know, healthy aging, um, picking a, or, or ed tech, picking a couple of areas where we have got quite a few uh, uh, people in our portfolio already. But I hope that we will continue and that everybody that's suitable will be able to get a loan offer. 
Um, and these are some logos of some people who um, are already our borrowers that we're very pleased with. Um, really proud to be lending to these people. Um, Callerly, uh, hopefully Tang's going to come along um, and be on our panel. Um, and uh, the next slide, um, hopefully I've got Bubble on here. Yes, we have Bubble. And, um, and I need to redo my slide because I haven't got All Street on here yet. I <laughs> um, uh, should have thought about that one. Um, okay. So what are we trying to do? This is about the objectives and the scope of the competition. We want cool stuff, basically, very, very broadly speaking. Cutting edge, game changing, highly innovative, disruptive, all those sorts of words. Stuff that's risky from an innovation point of view. Not regular, incremental, integrating, doing the normal, easy things. Um, we want stuff that's challenging, risky, and that because of that challenge and risk is going to mean that in, uh, typically commercial lenders will shy away from you um, and that maybe equity investors will say yeah I'd rather you put your money into sales and marketing on product number one uh, and, and let's not worry too much about product number two and three that you want to get a, a, a jump or get an advance on um, so that's the sort of things that we're looking for and any technology any sector any market um, we're open and this is one of my, actually, this is my favorite slide of the whole deck. This is what we want you to be doing. Experimental development, late stage R&D, prototyping, scaling up. Um, so this is in the guidance. Please have a read of it. Um, this is based very much on the uh, state aid framework that defines where we can play. Um, and I just highlight words like demonstrating, piloting, testing, validation, new or improved products, processes, or services. So it's pretty broad, but it's late stage. <coughs> and it may be that um, your technology readiness level might be quite high. You might know an awful lot about your tech and how it's going to work and how innovative it is, but you're not yet at the stage of scaling up, for example, the manufacturing side of things. And there's uncertainty and there's risk in that scaling up rather than in um, the original technology. So it's not necessarily about finding and proving a new idea. Grants are brilliant for that. It's about scaling up and getting to the market. And that still has significant uncertainty, significant risk, and that's what we want you to be doing. Um, there we go. I'm nearly on, probably actually, probably actually on time for once. I normally waffle for hours and hours and hours. Q&A. Um, if Emily can pick up any Q&A from online, and if um, Cara and um, um, Lindsay, <laughs> I'm useless. Um, Cara and Lindsay um, could hand around the microphones. Uh, we're happy to answer questions on what it's all about. Lady at the front. Uh, into the microphone, please. Then the people online will hear you as well. Um, uh, is it possible to see the successful applications files? Sorry? Is it possible to see successful applications files? Uh, no, it's not. A what is way. possible to see, and we have published it online for the first four competitions, are the name, location, project description, and um, amount of loan for successful applicants in the first four competitions. But more detail than that is private as between us and the um, applicant. Um, there's often um, IP considerations that they don't wish to share. Um, there's their detailed financials, which they wouldn't wish to share. But we definitely do show um, the public description that they say of their project. And that's a requirement for all applicants to provide us with a public description. If that field is blank, then sorry, you will be ineligible. But Provide us with a public description of your project, and then that will be published online. Once the entire competition has closed, and everybody we've decided either has, will not get a loan or is definitely going forward and, and, and uh, drawing down on their loan. So we don't show details of these competitions online until everybody is resolved, because I don't want to show this person has a conditional loan offer. If they then don't meet the comp conditions, then that's embarrassing for them. Actually, it's, it's, it's probably perfectly business as usual, but they don't necessarily want to tell the whole world about that, so we don't show it until 
after the entire competition has closed, which is slightly different from how Innovate UK works on our grant funding applications where we publicize um, everybody that has been successful in a grant competition at the point at which it's a conditional offer. Um, but that's just me being boring and technical. Um, ooh, lots now. Um, there's one there, and then we'll come back to folks over here. Uh, thanks. So you gave a good overview about how uh, you'd be eligible for this, but when uh, traditional lending wouldn't work for you. Could you talk a little bit about maybe why uh, or how you should position going for this rather than equity funding? Uh, I think that equity funding and an innovation loan are highly complementary. Um, uh, we have, uh, as I said in our initial pilot, we committed 50 million pounds. To date, we've drawn down about 24, 25 million pounds, I think it is. Businesses that we have lent to have, alongside our loan or subsequent to our loan, raised equity of 24 million pounds already. We're really, really pleased to see that. Um, and that's a discussion for you to have with your equity investors um, around sort of what they, what they want to see you doing if they were to invest in your company. Um, our focus is really, really specific, which is um, you know, later stage R&D, eligible project costs, that's it. And I'm sure that's something that our panel will talk about as well, the positioning there. We, we don't want to compete with the equity market. We really believe that we're complementary to that market. So over here with Cara. Hi, uh, a question, because I checked out some of your details. There's a question, have you applied before to Innovate UK? Yep. Um, hypothetically speaking, of course, if you happened hypothetically to so this work is for a friend, is it? For a friend, yes. <laughs> to work at a company that at 12.02 p.m. previously had been trying to put the information in and thus at midday only had part A and not part B uploaded, is that considered a new application or a repeat application? Uh, hypothetically, of course. Interesting question. Uh, I believe that would be a new, it would be a new application but because the, the previous one was incomplete and therefore sadly ineligible, um, it wouldn't counters having what we don't want people to do is keep throwing in the same thing and our assessors going yeah I said it didn't work last time um, and I said it didn't work the time before that just keep going through um, uh, it's, it's a particularly a restriction around the smart competition but we think that it works here as well and we don't want people banging their heads against what might appear to be um, actually a brick wall so someone that sadly was ineligible in the past uh, that wouldn't count as a previous application okay thank you I'll be sure to pass that to my friend Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. I have a question. Um, of, I mean, um, you said um, later stage of R and D. Yes. What do you mean by in terms of? I mean, in um, like the jargon of TRL. So in, in, G, in TRL terms, uh, I think we're talking five or six up to sort of eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Um, it, but it may be that your TRL is quite high but your manufacturing readiness level isn't there yet. It may be an MRL at you know, sort of five or six, and you want to bring that up so that they're at the similar level. Or it may be that your commercial readiness level isn't right. You're testing a business model that's entirely new. So that sort of thing. But it's fundamental. So, so that's an equivalent in TRL, MRL, CRL terms, um, but it's technically driven by the definition of experimental development that's set out in the um, state aid framework. But I hope that helps positioning. This, this person's Sorry, first of all, could you say what TRL and those other acronyms mean, please? So technology not... readiness level, manufacturing readiness level, and commercial readiness level. Those are How does the scale work? This works from um, TRL 1 is basically fundamental research. TRL 10, was it 9 or 10? I'm not a technical expert. Is basically NASA saying um, they got to the moon and back again. It worked. That those levels are applied more broadly in manufacturing industry. In the guidance for applicants, I think there's even a link to, or maybe it's no, no longer there, it might have been there in the past. But if you go to the um, Automotive Council, they have a good um, definition of it in, in automotive manufacturing terms. Um, Google it, there's, there's lots and lots of stuff around TRL, MRL, CRL that, um, that can help you around this positioning. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so now my actual question. Um, oh. Could you say a bit more to differentiate between eligibility for the loans and the smart grants? Because I'm not quite sure which side fit at the moment. Um, you can apply for both, or, or either rather, I should say. So smart is, in my opinion, best used if you're looking to find and prove a new idea. 
has, um, if you're doing a fe technical feasibility study or if you're doing industrial research, so proof of concept. Because the grant funding that's available to you then is a quite a high proportion of the eligible project costs. When you get to experimental development, that later stage of R&D, if you're a micro or a small business, the um, intensity of the grant, the proportion of the cost that will be covered by a grant at that later stage in something like SMART or any other competition that we run um, is going to come down to, for a micro or a small business, 45% of your eligible project costs. If you're a medium-sized business, down to 35% of your costs. And at that point, a lot of people go, oh, I'll go and polish my piece of kit till it's a bit shinier, um, rather than really getting them into the market. With an innovation loan, if you're at that later stage of R&D, you can get up to 100% of your eligible project costs covered by the loan, and in return, you pay us interest, you repay the loan. Either might work. It depends on your uh, situation, your funding strategy that goes alongside your technology strategy, your commercialization strategy. And regardless of innovation, Innovate UK's grants, you might even just say, actually, I'm just going to do it anyway and claim the R&D tax credits because it's not competitive. It's absolutely certain to be delivered um, because that's how R&D tax credits work. You can't have both for a project because um, they're both forms of state aid, but that's something for you to consider in your funding strategy together with your investors, your other directors, your shareholders, etc. cetera. Um, um, so I've got two sneaky questions. Um, one... Um, Smart grant. We're already we're already applying for one. We're in the process of so we just submitted that last week or mm -hmm. the week before um, with a consortium. Does that make us ineligible? And two, um, uh, if it's for the same project, then um, you can't have both grants. You can't have uh, sorry, both a grant and a loan um, or indeed R and D tax credits for the same project because that would be multiple forms of state aid for the same project. If they're different projects, then we'd look at your financial capability, your resources, your capability to deliver both of them, um, but not both at the same time. And the second one, quickly. Um, uh, we've already got a technology that's in place with a commercial proposition. Um, we're looking to scale that. Would that be eligible in this case? And I think it might go back to your earlier point. I, I think it would depend readiness. on what the nature of the uncertainty and the, the, the project that you want to carry out um, as to whether it's, uh, that would be uh, something for our assessors to consider. Okay. Um, I'm relying on, on Cara and, um, uh, and Lindsay to yeah. choose who I'll to go. Yeah. Uh, so it's <clears throat> not entirely dissimilar to that. Um, this is from a software perspective. Um, if we have an existing product, we're looking at developing a new version of that product, but the code base is entirely new, the functionality is entirely new, and in our, well, it does the same things, but we think does a lot more. What, what, how will that be judged? Will that be judged on the market readiness if we were just giving it to our existing customers, or will it be the kind of potential of this, if we paint a kind of picture of, oh, we'll be able to double our adoption rate, or sales rate as a result, what will it be judged on? Uh, I think both the market um, uh, uh, capability that you're developing and when you say it's all new, you have to rewrite the code or do something, how uncertain, how innovative, how much R&D is involved in that? Is it just um, you know, reprogramming a spreadsheet in Excel? I'm sure it's not, but that, to put a simplistic answer, our assessors might well say, hmm, that's not particularly innovative. If you're doing something that's just integrating existing technologies that's not really new, then probably not going to get a particularly high score from our assessors. If it's cool and clever and, and risky and doing stuff that hasn't been done before in a different sort of way, then our assessors might well consider that to be highly innovative. So it's um, worth, and we've got a couple of people yeah. on the panel who, um, from, from Joe and, um, and Silash, will talk about some cool digital stuff that they're doing that I don't understand. So they will answer the question far better than I will. Okay, so it might be worth leaning into the innovativeness of it if we're in this position. It's Innovate UK, yep. sort of the clues in, in, no in the name. Sorry to sound um, facetious. Uh, who's, who's next? Uh, uh, hello, I arrived late, so you may have covered this. Um, I'm wondering what kind of due diligence you do, whether it's your own due diligence, yep or whether you want third-party due diligence, particularly in terms of the market study or even the technology being developed, your own due diligence? Uh, so the project will be sent out to five technical and commercial assessors for them to score. 
Um, the company will be looked at um, by our credit team. We don't engage third parties to do uh, financial or operational or technological due diligence on our behalf. And, and I guess you want to meet the management team. Do they present to your committee or...? Um, one of the conditions of a loan offer is um, a management presentation. Uh, we want to see who we're talking to. We want to visit your premises because Swindon's really boring. Um, so why would you come to us? Um, and um, generally speaking, that's about confirming that the assumptions that we'd made, uh, the discussion around the market, around the adequacy of capitalization of the business. Generally speaking, we go in hoping to have a lot of the things we had based our decision on confirmed um, and to be pleasantly surprised. Very occasionally, and it's happened I think just a couple of times, We've gone in hoping for all of this to be confirmed and come out thinking, what on earth was that all about? These are people who actually haven't really explained what they're doing, who appear not to know what they're doing, um, and therefore we have not confirmed that offer. That's rare, um, but it's something that we are able to do. Um, it's because it's a condition before the loan starts. So failing the management presentation, hopefully you don't do it, but it's not unheard of. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who's next with the, um, and then we need to come to the, the, the lady at the front. Uh, just to um, clarify one point you uh, flagged, in terms of if we have a parallel application already in the Innovate process mm -hmm. covering the same topic, mm -hmm. um, and we can file, of course, now for a innovation loan. And of course, if the application go through, you're saying that we can't have both nope. covering the same costs, but we right. can have both in terms of parallel costs, they don't overlap. Uh, if they're different projects. So what is a different project then, basically? If, it's, if we have partially under our grant part of the project and partially under the same project an innovation loan, but the costs are not overlapping. If the costs are not overlapping, then you would need to have articulated that they are different projects. Okay. So, so one of the things we ask you to do, the same with HMRC when you're looking at R&D tax credits, is to define something, to ring fence it, to say this is about getting from here to here, work packages one, two, three, four, costs a, you know, this, 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 people that, 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 timesheets, um, bill of materials, all those things, absolutely ring fence. That makes a project. Something else is a different project. Um, what we can't do is offer you a grant to do this work in a project that covers, let's say, half of the project costs and for you then to borrow the money to cover the other half. That would be two forms of state aid for the same project and would reduce your skin in the game, which we wouldn't want to do from a credit point of view, so I hope that explains. Okay. Um, while Lindsay's bringing the um, microphone down to the front for the, for the lady in blue here, um, online we have some questions from Emily. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. So... The first question is, in the repayment period, how are the repayments structured? Um, quarterly, the same amount each quarter, um, based on the principal plus the deferred interest, plus interest on both of those, um, looking at the entire repayment period and looking at a level payment that means that by the end of the period, it's all repaid. Thanks. I've got a couple more. Um, can we apply for a loan if we are waiting on investment but it's not yet secured? Um, you can apply. Um, please explain that in your, particularly in Part B of the application, um, and uh, we will we will look at how credible we think that uh, the, the assertions that you make um, are. Um, if it's yeah, I thought I, you know, I once heard a, an angel talk at, a, at an event, and I might think about going and talking to them again one day. That's probably not particularly clear and confirming and solid. Um, if you're, you know, just if you've got a signed term sheet and you're going through the due diligence process and hopefully wrapping it up, that sounds pretty close, and we'd quite, we, we would certainly take that into account. It might be that at that point we might make a conditional loan offer, so that closing that equity round um, or that investment may be a condition, and when that's done, if we think it's appropriate and adequate and all the everything else stacks up, then we might say when that's done then you can start on our loan at the same time. And we have certainly done that um, on a number of occasions in the first five competitions. Sometimes we've said um, you can start drawing down the loan, but you can't continue unless um, uh, a future 
equity round closes because we think that that makes sense from your financial forecasts, from the, um, uh, from the assumptions that were made and the capitalization of the business going forward. And could you please explain a bit more about how to overcome the UID test? Um, how to over so the undertakings and difficulty tests. Scott will be talking about this. He's got a lovely slide on it later. But basically, there's um, the core way to over so the undertaking and difficulty test is from the um, state aid regulations, which basically says that if you are an SME and you are more than three years old and you have um, accumulated losses that exceed 50% of your subscribed share capital then you are classified for the point of view of Article 25 of the General Block Exemption Regulations and some others, um, that you are considered to be an undertaking in difficulty and therefore the state should not be propping up your business that's in difficulty. Um, you will probably say, but I'm a technology-led business and I'm fine, I'm a going concern, blah, blah, blah. It's a test and I'm sorry, but it exists. Fundamentally, we might also look at you and say, yeah, notwithstanding the undertaking and difficulties test, we think you're inadequately capitalized and it doesn't make sense for you to borrow money without enough capital to back that. So for me, there's one really simple way to pass the undertakings and difficulty test and that's to be adequately capitalized. You might also wish to um, look at that and look at how your capital is structured. Maybe you've got loads and loads of director loans or shareholder loans and not much equity. Well, one way to change that might be to change those loans into equity, which is perhaps what they ought to have been in the first place. I'm quite equity biased, so if you don't agree with me, then that's fine. Um, it may be that you have an accounting policy that says we will write off all of our um, R&D expense to P&L and never, ever consider capitalizing it. Talk to your accountants, talk to financial advisors, think about your, the appropriateness of your accounting policy, and it may be subject to... Um, the uh, financial accounting standards, um, uh, financial reporting standards, the agreement of your auditors and accountants, the agreement of your shareholders and your board, uh, and maybe the stock exchange if you're a publicly listed company. It may be that looking at your accounting policy around what development expenditure might appropriately be capitalized um, as an intangible asset rather than expense to the P&L, it may be that that's something that you might want to consider. I can't recommend that to you. I can certainly suggest that you speak to an appropriate financial, accounting, legal, compliance, regulatory experts in order to determine whether that's the right thing for you to consider doing. Did I hedge my bets well enough there? I tried really hard. Um, okay. Last one. Last one. If the product starts off as an internal tool to allow business growth and then could potentially be a commercial product in the future, is that eligible? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Lady at the front. A uh, quickish one. Um, so if you're a high growth business or hoping to achieve high growth as a result of this loan um, and you forecast that over the six to seven period of the loan um, that you will have further equity runs, um, so in terms of representing that in the financials, in the forecasts, and in the assumptions, to what extent, wh where do we include all of that information? Um, um, where it fits. So if in year, if at time zero, which is the drawdown period, you expect to raise some equity alongside the loan, show it there, please. If in a year's time you're expecting, I don't know, your, your Series A round, um, show it there, please. If in the future there's going to be a Series B round, show it there, please. Show it in the cash flow forecast. Show perhaps also the, um, you know, make sure that you show the expenditure that relates to that because you're going to be investing in further R&D, further sales and marketing. Don't show, please, that you have a you know, cash balance of zero today and in three years' time you have a cash balance of 10 million because you've had a 10 million pound investment um, and it's not been used for anything. That tends not to look great from an assumptions point of view. Um, so showing it in the cash flow forecast at the appropriate time, um, ideally showing us um, the assumptions on which that's underpinned, demonstrating that those are credible, that you've had conversations with investors that shows that it's not just, uh, and we have had some applications that say, gosh, I'm completely undercapitalized today, but don't worry because I'm going to raise five million in two years' time and it'll all be fine. And they've no investment today from third parties. They've clearly not addressed the market. Those people are, are, are harder to find credible, perhaps, than those that have said, you know, I've raised this, 
Um, I've got an idea of what the next thing should be and when it should happen and blah, blah, blah. And again, the, our, our investors on the, on the panel will talk about that from their experience because I know um, they have all um, raised additional investment. Okay, we, we, we need to, I'm cutting into the panel now, so um, perhaps the last couple of questions. Okay, could I um, notice the numbers of uh, 50 million, 73 loans yes. suggest that the average loan is circa 700,000. Correct. Is there a preference to go for those higher level loans, nearly your million, versus, a, say, a £200,000 loan? No preference at all. Provided that it's between £100,000 and a million pounds, um, we are very happy to look at it. Um, the person who applied in the last competition for a £95,000 loan, um, we sadly have to, will have to say it's ineligible because it's between 100000 and a million. Right, I'm going to grab us there while we've stopped and um, introduce our panel. I'm really, really pleased that um, Rod Beer from the UK Business Angels Association is going to come and stand here and, and lead things. Um, we have Joe from Bubble, uh, Tang from Callaly, and um, Silash from All Street, uh, and Tim Murley, who's uh, our Chief Investment Officer here at Innovate UK, um, are going to um, answer some questions. And I apologize that I've eaten into your time from the questions. No worries, Nigel. Standard. Ouch! <laughs> you was doing it very well, then he kind of went over it a little bit. So, look, um, lovely to meet you all, and thank you for having me, Nigel, as ever. Um, so, those of you who don't know me and, and what we do here, I'm, I'm Roderick Beer, and I'm the managing director of the UK Business Angels Association. We're the trade body for angel and early stage investing in our ecosystem, and our, we look after about 200 organizations, 15,000 investors that deploy about a billion pounds per annum into early stage UK businesses via equity. Um, as big supporters of growth businesses, we are all about supporting and getting involved in and helping to grow amazing companies. We're also a big fan in maximum growth with minimal dilution, as I'm sure many of you founders out there would be as well, because that uh, your shares are incredibly valued in the, in the future, we hope. Um, so we're really keen to help support different forms of finance. We work very closely with Innovate UK. A lot of the smart grants are match funding, which gets matched up against our, our angel money as well. Um, and so we're very supportive of things that the Innovate UK do, but also always very interested in a new type of funding mechanism that can really help and support early stage businesses. So innovation loans is something that I'm very interested in personally too. So I'd like to start off by um, asking our panellists, Joe, Tang, Silash and Tim, to introduce themselves. I'll start with you, Joe. Thank you. Slightly readjust that. Um, my name's Joe Eckersley. I'm the founder and CEO of Bubble. And Bubble is a marketing technology company disrupting the ad tech and martech space. Um, traditionally, that space has um, moved very quickly into um, data models um, that have driven advertising onto mobile phones through apps and through um, service providers. Um, I don't like that, personally. I think it's intrusive. I think it's a fast track down as opposed to up. I think the revenues that are generated are, are short term. And what we decided as a company of marketers who came together to solve the problems around fraud and all sorts of issues that are facing the ad tech sector was to come up with a platform that allowed the distribution of content via a plug-in to mobiles. So we essentially plug into any app and we supercharge it, enabling it to work as a location-based tool to distribute everything from push notifications to comprehensive surveys to um, video content, audio content, etc. Um, this project that we had funding for was critical to us because we'd reached a point through grant um, support where we were able to do all the proof of concept and development of prototype. We'd been working with potential commercial trial partners or commercial clients who were trial partners. But what we needed to do was we need to consider what um, improvements in technology like 5G would, what the impact would be on our product. Um, 5G is critical. That type of new advancement in telecoms is critical to us because it essentially allows us to flip a geofencing model that we use externally to an internal space, whether that's multi-floor or, or just inside a building. And it also enables us to do things like live use um, benefit from the um, improved latency around um, 
live stream video and live stream audio, et cetera, um, and, and overlays using augmented reality. Um, it meant that we literally had to look at redesigning the whole of our product in order to be able to capitalize on that emerging technology, which will be so revolutionary for our space. And this funding allowed us to do it. And as a company, it's put us very much, it's given us a lot of support, um, knowing that we've been successful in this competition um, for um, the loan funding has meant that we've won a number of awards. We've, we've been able to stick our head over the parapet and say, this is what we're doing. Um, we were named as one of the Unbound 50 Best Startups in Most Innovative Startups competition. Um, we've won, surprisingly, awards in ad tech Europe, bearing in mind we're a MarTech product, not an ad tech product, because we're disrupting in that space. Um, we were one of the three finalists across the whole of Europe in that competition. Um, and disruption is really what it's about. And I think I, I was very, as um, uh, Nigel very kindly alluded to, I was named one of the five rising stars by Computer Weekly in their most influential women in tech awards for 2019 this year. And I believe a large portion of that is because we're able to be brave because we have the funding to do the technology changes that we need to about the fact that we're disrupting an industry that's actually, you know, quite forceful in the way it dominates and the way it pushes down a certain path so you know advertising is quite an adversary as an industry and we've been able to stand up and say actually we don't think it should go like that with the confidence that having money behind us has been able to give us thank you joe fantastic well i think you've answered pretty much all of my questions Sorry, for the rest of the session you. excellent <laughs> or any, any questions anyone <laughs> um no uh tang can you go can you uh, give us a bit of an intro on yourself sure hi uh, my name is Tang Vota. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Callily. So Callily is a uh, inventor, manufacturer, and seller of innovative new femcare products. And when I say femcare, that's our preference instead of saying feminine hygiene products. So we've been at it for over 10 years. My fellow co-founder is one of the most senior gynecologists in the UK. After being a gynecologist for 35 years, listening to thousands of women, there has been no new feminine hygiene meaningful innovation in over 80 years. And every news outlet will, will say that. So we've spent a long time uh, patenting and protecting and R&Ding a revolutionary new product. Uh, we have several of them, but the first one is called a tamp liner. And a tamp liner combines uh, a tampon and a panty liner because 70% of women who use tampons actually also use a panty liner at the same time. And the market is half the planet, and there has been, and hasn't been any new innovation. So we have, over uh, the years, gotten Innovate UK grants. We've been able to move forward. Uh, but then the hard part has been building the business and uh, commercializing this wonderful invention. So uh, it was game-changing for us to get an innovation, uh, uh, Innovate UK loan. Uh, because the million pound loan allowed us to build commercial machinery to manufacture ten thousands, th tens of thousands of units per day. Um, so uh, we had a great idea, patents around the world, spent seven figures getting the patents, uh, but that's the easy part, inventing something. The hard part is building a business, commercializing it, building a brand, dealing with regulations, everything. And uh, we could have raised a lot more equity if we wanted to, but as we all know, as owners, you don't want to give away uh, ownership. And uh, we couldn't go to uh, conventional uh, lenders because they wouldn't take a risk on a machine that's never been built before. Um, and so we tried our luck applying for innovation loan and got a million pounds. It's been a fantastic, fantastic um, uh, funding that, which comes with so many benefits. As, as Joe said, uh, it's uh, very prestigious funding. Uh, we've been able to leverage that to raise more money at better terms, and uh, we keep on getting the fruits uh, of the effort we put into the application. Just uh, yesterday, we were in the Sunday Times uh, talking about femtech and exponential trajectories, but they describe us as a company that has received a one million pound innovation loan from Innovate UK. Um, that is a badge of honor that we wear, that we wear and we use and we leverage uh, to, to, uh, for maximum effect.
So uh, the machine is now done and we just turned on 72 hours ago and uh, I, I shouldn't be here because our, <laughs> our uh, office is very busy, but uh, always happy to be here and uh, answer any questions about innovation, uh, Innovate UK loans. Thanks, Dan. Silash. Yeah, so uh, my name is Silash Ruparel. Uh, I'm the co-founder of All Street Research. Uh, we have developed an application called Sever, which is a cognitive assistant for investment research. So the problem that we're trying to address is that 80% uh, and investment analysts in large financial institutions spend 80% of their time reading documents and narrative information. They could be using this time in order to do the things that humans are very good at, like critical thinking, like talking to companies and um, doing a lot more analytical work. They spend all this time just, just reading. So we've developed Sever, which is an AI brain which gives superpowers to investment analysts. And it does this by enabling them to read thousands and thousands of documents in an instant and extracting from those documents all of the relevant information that they need in order to complete their uh, investment analysis and putting that narrative information into the right place within their investment thesis. Um, it's, a huge and, uh, it's a huge market that's going, undergoing a lot of disruption at the moment. So um, the market at the moment it globally is 20 billion for uh, investment uh, research payments. And it's undergoing disruption because there have been some huge regulatory ch changes that many people might be aware of. They're called MIFID II. They've come from the EU. And what they've done is completely changed the way in which investment research is paid for. So in the past, incredibly, investment research was actually given away by large investment banks to asset managers. But the ridiculous thing about it was that it was the, the way it was given away was that they were just building it into dealing commissions. What that me meant in practice was that asset managers were pay play paying much higher spreads when they were um, uh, trading with investment banks. And the effect of that is that um, yours and my pension pots that are being managed by these asset managers are being eroded because they're just paying for lots of unnecessary investment research out of de dealing commissions. That whole regulatory environment has changed and they actually now have to put a dollar or a pound price on every single piece of research that they buy. What's that, what that's meant is that uh, they are much now much more um, susceptible to uh, market forces within the investment research market. It means that they have to focus much more on the quality of the content that they produce, the quality of their analysis they produce, and they also have to be much more um, uh, uh, wary about how much they're spending on uh, uh, across the board. What that means is the whole market is ripe for technology disruption, and uh, you're seeing a lot of um, uh, technology solutions come into the market. Uh, the other side of the equation is that uh, for, for all of us as knowledge workers, there will be huge disruption from artificial intelligence. It's coming, it's happening five years from now, ten years from now. Some of the tools that we will be using on our desktops will, will feel as natural as we, we use in Word, Word and Excel today. And they'll feel just, a, just completely normal where you're going to have your machine or your computer actually just giving you information, telling you things that are relevant to you. And so whilst we have an exciting market within investment research, research actually the bigger opportunity for us is the, this whole n domain of um, knowledge automation, which McKinsey estimates will generate five to seven trillion of, of value globally over the next 10 years or so. So it's, a, it, it's an amazing opportunity. Um, we came through uh, the, our, our sort of phases of development through um, uh, a combination of different sources of funding. We had um, external funding from, uh, from uh, private investors. We also put in some money ourselves as founders and had some revenues from the company. But we also had grants from Innovate UK, especially in the earlier stages where we were really at the prototyping stage. Uh, we've gone through all of that, all of those phases um, towards launching our, our minimum viable product and uh, beyond that into commercialization. So we're now at the commercialization stage for Sever and we've, uh, we've onboarded um, uh, our first clients and we're uh, at, the fa at the stage where we're, we're earning uh, pretty good revenues from those clients. So this was the perfect opportunity for us to go, go and get a, an innovation loan from, from Innovate UK. Uh, we're at a slightly earlier stage than both um, Joe and Thang in terms of the, the use that we put it, put, put it for because we've only just drawn down our first tranche under the loan uh, a couple of months ago. So we, but we, what, we're, what we're really excited about is that this loan is going to give us the ability to take some elements of our product, particularly the ability to produce research con content directly from our machine, 
and push that content directly into the market. So uh, we're developing a whole load of new, uh, new and exciting AI technology in order to create new forms of research content which will, which will just take the whole investment research product in the market to, to the next level. So this is going to help us at that late stage of R&D where we've done all the prototyping and now we can go out there and uh, just uh, uh, increase our presence and increase the product range that we have. Thanks, Alash. Um, as some of you may know, highly deep tech businesses require a longer gestation period before they can start to get that commercial traction needed to unlock other forms of finance. So actually, I'm going to lead that into uh, Tim and ask you to not only introduce yourself, your good self, but also to give a bit of maybe perhaps your own perspective on some of the other, other sources of funding that are out there and available to these early stage companies and what your views are of those. Uh, hi, Tim Murley. Uh, I'm afraid I'm the boring banker. Uh, <laughs> so a pale into insignificance against these particular guys. I, I do have some historical relevant experience, having uh, done a couple, led a couple of startups some while back <clears throat> in the heady days of the dot-com bubble era. Um, so if you think there's some wacky ideas around now, you should see some of the wacky ideas around then. So uh, the bank I worked for, the Treasury guys decided they wanted to play in the VC market, uh, which meant that we could interview people all day long. Um, subsequent to that, I ran a number of businesses and managed to clock up about uh, 50 different directorships. So I'm, I'm pretty keen on the robustness of businesses generally. Um, subsequent to that, I managed to bail out just at the right time uh, when things started going awry in the banking market, uh, started doing business mentoring, uh, then joined Startup Loans, which some of you may have heard of, uh, where I was on the board and uh, ran the Audit and Risk Committee uh, under the British Business Bank. Um, later then got involved with the Credit Committee uh, for these guys and uh, joined some days ago uh, on this particular side. So any awkward questions, I'm going to pass right over to <laughs> Nigel, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'll give you to Scott. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Nigel and Scott are here, and they've got a lot more uh, depth than I have. Um, but I'd, I'd like to dodge the question just for a minute, if I, if I may. Of course. Uh, Rob, because um, I spent the weekend, much to my wife's displeasure, looking at a lot of the applications. And uh, we've probably got around 100 this week to review. Um, and if you're going to look at this seriously... Uh, then you're going to have to give them some time. Uh, we have a special purpose vehicle that's been set up to review these, and um, hence one of the reasons why I'm around, I'm the boring banker, and therefore we have to look at the governance and the risk of these. Um, and I've been somewhat surprised at the, the variation in quality, as Nigel has hinted, uh, in terms of the applications. Uh, I mean, you guys are looking for funding, and I think you're probably more aware of the variation in funding available to you than I am, um, but I would have expected, in all honesty, a better quality of applications as a generalisation. I did get very excited yesterday afternoon about 2 o'clock. Nothing to do with the rugby. But we had a, a business case put forward where the guys had seen an opportunity in the marketplace, uh, existing marketplace, but they could put a new product in, which was going to change uh, fabric quite considerably. They knew the size of the market. They knew who the biggest competitor was, what share of the market they had what revenues they were taking, what margins were available, etc. And they were able to translate that through into uh, robust financials. Yeah? So we could believe yeah, what these guys are doing. Um, but that was slightly unusual, I've got to say. Yeah? So you know, we are willing to take risk, as Nigel has said. That's what we're all about. Um, but we are expecting a return for the economy. Uh, it, taxpayers expect a return on this money one way or the other and you know, we don't want the Taxpayers Alliance or the journalists knocking on the door one day saying we're giving the money away either. So we do have a robust credit process which Scott will be taking you through later on uh, but what I would encourage you to do is to make your business look joined up. Yeah, you've got to sell us the story in terms of what you're trying to sell, who you're trying to sell it to, the numbers of sales you're making, you know, even the prices in relation to that. And it translates into the financials. Yeah? We want to see a set of financials that work because we want to support the businesses. Because one of our, our own hopes is that we're going to move from pilot to business as usual. We're hoping to get more funding. So we want to see more opportunities. Have I dodged the question? 
successfully. Thank you. <laughs> um, and actually, just, just kind of leading, you know, on the back of that as well, from an equity perspective, it's, it's absolutely crucial that if you're going to go for some funding, you go properly for it. Um, one of the, strong, the, the, the most valuable commodities is your shares, but second to that is your time. And if you're going to do a, a poor application, if you're going to go out trying to raise equity without going for it properly, you are not going to succeed. And it's a waste of the time that you have put in there. So if you're going to do it, in my view, I think you should do it properly. And um, so thanks for that, Tim. So I think we're going to move on to asking a bit of questions around the grant, around the loan itself, and, and, and get it understanding as to why you kind of went for it. So let's start with you, Joe. Why did you apply for an innovation loan? Why not a grant? Why not you know, use R&D tax credits, bank debt, or whatever? What was the kind of main driver for that for you? We had had um, grants previously um, to do the proof of market, proof of concept, and um, we'd self-funded the prototype development as best we could. Mm. Um, we have um, had SEIS investment and a small amount of EIS investment. We've got 21 shareholders, uh, £500,000 of, of, of equity that we'd sold, and we were capitalising the asset of the IP that we were building up. Mm. So you know, we were building up a good position. Um, we had a number of trial partners. We were exploring the potential of our technology actually being strong enough to commercialise, and it wasn't quite there yet. But that put us in a position where we couldn't get conventional bank loans or extend you know, the small bank overdraft facility we already had. Um, we, we, we had little choice there available to us to take us from that point of having a product we knew we'd established market need for, where we knew we needed to do some, um, some additional work in order to sustain it long term, and that was around rebuilding the back end of our technology. I think one guy over there was asking about, you know, sort of the software side of things. We literally had to do what you were asking about. Um, you know, we had software that worked, um, which we are now commercialising, but we needed to make sure that we rebuilt the back end into a microservices structure to accommodate 5G tech as we were going forward. And, you know, it's quite hard to get a bank manager, with all due respect, um, <laughs> To understand, um, yeah, so let alone the software we were building, we well, then had the problem of the, first place. Of the marketing the technology. <laughs> the marketing industry is like, you know, sort of people just don't understand how it works. Um, it's, an, it's a dark art, along with software, another dark art. Um, that combination really didn't work when it came to, you know, sort of conventional sources. So, but it highly innovative and, you know, met the criteria. And for us, it's, it was just an, a complete no-brainer. It mm. it's, sits alongside our commercialization and our generation of commercial value. It meant that we didn't have to give away more equity too early. We've now opened another round now, but Great. we've been able to delay it. It's been made a massive difference for us. Thank you. Tang, you've been through, I think you've done quite a bit of equity as well at the start. You've had quite a different forms of funding coming in. What's your, what was the main, why, why the loan and why not others? Uh, well, similar to Joe, we did uh, SEIS, EIS, um, and then we, we put in our own money and had a couple uh, supportive angels. Um, and then we got grants, which is very helpful, similar, similar to you, to move things forward. And then uh, having proven revenue and people are willing to buy our product, albeit at a massive negative margin until we built the machine, we had that typical decision that any founder will have, do I raise more money from uh, you know, debt or equity? What's the best way to do this? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the benefits of uh, the innovation loans, I'm sorry I wasn't here for uh, mm -hmm. Nigel's earlier part, but it, it was just, it, it was uh, really um, it's so obvious. It, you've got these loans, I've already mentioned about the prestigious side of it, but it's also affordable, it's low interest rate, it's flexible, you can, we're, we're not paying back our loan in full until six years from our drawdown. But also, it was fast. Um, one, one thing for us is, um, and I, I do have a finance background, but within three months of submitting our application, we, are, we had our first drawdown, and that is completely unprecedented. So it was a, a no-brainer uh, to, to apply for this, which was also, of course, non-dilutive. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned the prestige, but uh, it was, yeah, there's no reason not to go for this source of funding. But then, uh, um, Rod, you mentioned about equity. We have been able to, we have to raise a lot more than the one million pound loan. So we've been able to leverage off of the million pound loan to raise another four. 
um, in the last 12 months. Um, but uh, I will just finish off with one thing that's important for us. We, uh, we're motivated by different things. We're a B Corp, which is a type of company that balances the planet and people, um, not just trying to get profits. And we're absolutely committed to manufacturing um, because of the sensitive nature of the product that we're uh, manufacturing. We want to manufacture here in the UK. Um, and th that's expensive and difficult. So um, uh, ha having the innovate, innovate Loan and the prestige from that and being able to see, pe uh, uh, for people to understand that we're very focused on, on, on keeping it here, that all is part of uh, the benefit of applying for this loan. Fantastic. Thank you. Tang Sanash, what, what uh, was the big driver of Yeah, see, see above, really. It's just yeah, like yeah, all, yeah. all the things that um, Joe and Tang have Matt mentioned. I guess from our side, there has been also a bit of a, a strong social purpose as well. Part of the uh, results of this, these recent regulatory changes has been that actually a lot of companies have seen the research coverage about them in the market drop, uh, and the hit has been particularly strong for smaller and mid-sized companies, uh, both uh, in, in Europe and elsewhere, and certainly in the UK. And one of the... Um, uh, achievements or elements that we wanted to put in place was to uh, bring some infrastructure into the market which would enable very rapid and technology driven coverage of smaller companies that might that might not otherwise have research coverage about them because there's a lot of studies out there that show that uh, the more research coverage there is about a small company the more likely it is to be able to attract funding and attract growth growth and uh, st uh, capital in the stock market. So we also have a strong pur social purpose behind us. Um, we, we're not a B Corp, but we do have uh, a, we are set up as a, um, a social uh, organization as well. So uh, that's, that's been another part of, or another, a, a real strong driving element. Um, in terms of the loan itself, I just really echo what's been said already mm. about the fact that it just really <coughs> enables you to get that later stage in innovation to push out some of these more um, cutting-edge technologies into the market where you've already proven what you can do. Actually, when I got you, Celeste, um, explain mm. a bit, were you trading? Are you turning over any, any commercial revenues? Yes, we are. We've, uh, we've onboarded our first few clients and we're, we're in um, uh, late-stage trials with a number of other clients. And when it came to the, the, the application for the, for the loan, were you trading yeah. as well at the same time? Yes, yeah. And so, Tang, was that the same for you guys? A pre-revenue, I'm guessing, or are you doing some early sales and some commercial traction? Uh, we, we 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 were we were generating definitely generating generating revenue. Sorry, yeah. but it doesn't matter. I mean, that's the problem with the capital markets and and, and, and capitalism and in, in total. Because who cares if you're generating revenue? I mean, are you ever going to be profitable? Right? It makes makes little sense to me. And I think it's a big bubble about to burst again. Um, for us, we so we could. We were generating some revenue, but it was at a massive negative margin. We had mm -hmm. to build this machine, and that allows us to be profitable. So we, we did have revenue, and I think that's obviously important to Innovate UK because, um, uh, again, we were always told back when we were applying that it's, it's really more for scale-ups, not necessarily startups. ups um, but we are in, kind of in between both. So, um, so yeah, we Jay? were generating. No, we weren't generating revenue. We were we had just um, got funding through an investment round earlier on in the in the period just before we got the loan. Mm. Um, and I think what it's what it's enabled us to do is it enabled us to actually work out how we were going to commercialise and how we should should structure financing going forward in a way that would sustain growth as opposed to that hand to mouth um, position that you find yourself in between startup and scale up which is where we were I think it's known as the valley of death and I think I would agree with that um, you know it is a very tough place to be um, but what it's what it gave us was time to fully benefit from the equity that we'd sold and the, the investment that we'd had from from angels and marry that with the ability to reconsider the way we were building our tech so you know we are now able to generate revenue um, and given the kind of the application, you know, you are you're borrowing, so you're going to be able to justify and show that you can service that loan effectively as well. Yeah. So, what kind of for, for those in the room who may not be at, at, have any commercial traction at all? I mean, what areas did you focus on your application to try and justify or to demonstrate to Innovate UK that you may not be turning over now, but it's actually quite close. You know, we have we're, yeah. we're not too far away. I think we were we were very thorough. Um, well, I, I believe we were very thorough. Nigel, <laughs> we were very thorough on the market analysis piece and where the opportunity was in the market, explaining mm. how 
um, fast uh, from a digital perspective the marketing industry is growing and what the opportunity was for the UK within that because we are leaders in in marketing technology and the delivery of marketing and advertising internationally you know we are one of the major players and I think we, we put a lot of effort into making sure that the evidence of the opportunity in the sector and also the effort that we'd already put into building our profile and you know our knowledge of that space and our standing within that space as, mm. as professionals came across in the application so we were a safe pair of hands to to, to yeah. trust, to be able to exploit the opportunity. And ties back to Tim's point about a good rigorous application where you're putting in, doing your research and showing <laughs> that you understand your market and what you're trying to achieve with it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, since it, you, you know, you've, you've all had the money and you presume you spent a lot of it, if not all of it, um, what, have you, um, what, is, what has that money actually been able to do for you? I mean, what, what, um, what has it unlocked for you as a business? I'll go to you, Tang. Sure. Um, uh, besides the things that I've already mentioned, um, I guess there was one other point I probably sh should have said is that, um, you know, there's a mantra in business, especially in the tech world, it's move fast and break things, right? Um, but for us, that absolutely doesn't work. We manufacture feminine hygiene products, and we cannot get that wrong, even one instance of it. So we have to take our time and do this right. And you can't have, uh, and this is our hesitation, uh, we are absolutely inundated by every major consumer goods of EC firm knocking on our door multiple times a week. Um, they're smelling femtech, they're smelling making money, but they, they, it's an aggressive form of capital and, um, that you have to spend the money within 18 months and hit, hit a massive inflection point. It's grow, 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 get revenue, be a unicorn, but who cares if you make money? I, I don't think that works. Um, and the, the back to my earlier point about patient capital, we, we need long-term partners to, to do this right. Um, so for us, I would say that, but also when I say do it right, it's also at a higher standard of excellence. I'm sure we would have found a way to build a machine. There's no doubt about that. But we were able with this much capital to find the best partners possible, to take no compromise. And then I, I believe that excellence will filter down to our product. So um, it was, again, transformational to have that access to capital that's willing to be your long-term partner. Rod, can I just come in there? I mean, sure. we were, uh, the business has been going, uh, in terms of the loans business, about 18 months, and uh, not surprisingly, we started to see the first signs of defaults. Uh, so we are prepared to take a higher level of risk, as you'll see when our accounts are finalised and uh, posted in soon. Um, but we will be there. Yeah, we want to be there with you when you're going through this program and we want to help you succeed. Yeah, so we've got the monitoring officers, you've got the credit support, etc. And this week, you know, we, we're going out and visiting clients who are struggling to meet their original objectives to see how we can help them move forward. So it's not a one-off, we give you the funds and off you go. We want you to succeed. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Um, Silash, I want to ask you a slightly different question. Um, <laughs> if the innovation loan wasn't there, what would you have done to fund what you want to do? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I guess you would always find a way to do it, right? That's the nature of entrepreneurship. So you, you always find a way around it. For us, it would, have, it would certainly have meant that our R&D would have been curtailed. Our product development would have been curtailed. So we would have gone to market. We would have gone into battle with, with what we have. Uh, we're a very, very aggressively sales-driven organization. So our, our whole um, corporate ethos is about engaging very heavily with, with our clients, understanding what they want, understanding what our prospects want, and tweaking the product accordingly. So I think what would have happened would have been that we'd, we'd have gone to market with a much, a much more watered down product, and no doubt that would have impacted um, our time to market, our ability to deliver the types of features that our clients wanted, our ability to scale up much more quickly. Um, so. We'd have got there in the end, I'm sure, but it would have been a much, much more, much more painful, much more drawn out process. Um, what this does is it gives it gives you that time to really engage with your clients, really understand what they want. It buys buys you that, that kind of commercialization runway that you might not not otherwise have. Um, to echo what Tang said, if you have to go straight into a Series A. Um, you don't want to do that when you're not fully equipped to do it, and I think um, uh, you want to you want to learn some more lessons. You want to learn, you you want to make a few more mistakes. There's nothing wrong with that, and learn from those mistakes before you before you really get into playing with the big boys. So this this gives us that real breathing space. 
I completely agree with that. You know, I mean, as Tang was saying about moving fast and breaking things, there's only so long that you can do that for before you actually have to build something that's a quality product that's going to actually stack up, particularly if you're going for a land grab in a very competitive market. And most of our competitors have set up shop here in London from the US. Although they've got third-party dependencies as far as technology is concerned and legacy technology that they're strapped with, you know, um, we still need to build something that's a quality product if we're going to actually capture the market share that we have the potential to capture. And you have to get to a point where you've got something that is commercially viable and will stack up in that sort of competitive environment. And why shouldn't startups and scale-ups be, you know, sort of capturing that type of market share? You know, it's, you know, I mean, we... It's, it, you, you go from that startup mentality to scale up mentality, and this supports you taking that, that transition, mm. moving from you know, sort of pre seed to seed, then seed to series A. You know, it's important, it buys you time that you don't normally have. Um, so you're not tripping over yourself, you're actually going into it in a much more considered, structured, and scalable way. Thanks, Joe. I think the reality, it seems to me, that there's, there's not a lot of debt available out there at your sort of stages of business. Equity, as we all know, is can be difficult, expen very expensive in the longer term, but also there is no application form when it comes to equity. It's about pounding the pavements and selling hard, so it's not easy as well. So this, would, you, would it be a fair assumption this kind of sits quite neatly in between the two to help support that, that bridge from start to scale? Yeah, because it's, it, it gives you a greater valuation as well. You know, our valuation at last December, when we first you know, sort of took the loan, um, w was considerably less than we would be valued at now mm. going into this round that we're going into now because essentially what we've got now is something that, that has had money invested in making sure that it's future-proof. The R&D piece that we're doing that supports our core product is going to mean that we are secure going forward and can actually scale no matter what happens economically. Um, you know, in, in what is actually quite a turbulent time for businesses in the UK at the moment. So it, it's, it's been fundamental. Tim, is this a step, almost a good step backwards to the good old days of, the, of your local bank manager where you can have a chat with them, have a discussion and get a decent loan based on your business plan? Is, it, is this what it is? Is it uh, I'm not sure the heady people, days of... I'm not sure many people remember the good old days, no. to be honest. Yeah, they, were, they were so mm -hmm. long ago. <laughs> they were. I mean, it's, it's about relationships, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see the amount that coming in our pipeline and the, month that, you know, the ones that come out the other end, et cetera. So uh, you know, we're looking to scale up as a business in our own right. Yep. So you know, we're looking to recruit to be able to support more loans, but more support for people who have those loans as well. Fantastic. And as it comes down to it, innovation is a key part to the growth and success of UK PLC. So look, we're gonna, we've been running over a little bit of time, so I'm going to go to the audience for some Q&A as well. So give some why you... Just two questions from the audience. Are there any coming in online as well that we can all, whilst you're all thinking about some, some of your questions to ask as well? Hands up. We've got a question over here. And Nigel's got a question, or are you just being helpful? No, I was just pointing out. Very good. <laughs> you can ask later, Nigel. You can ask later. Can't have Nigel asking questions. No, he'll be here all day. He'll be here all day. <laughs> uh, it was mentioned uh, uh, by Nigel and also Tim, you echoed this, that uh, it's not just the money, but there's also support in terms of Obviously, there's a quarterly review, but I think you you know you mentioned um, you use the word moderator, or I can't remember now the, the yeah the monitoring goes, monitoring yeah. monitoring. Yeah. Is, can you maybe elaborate a bit on that? I mean, obviously, e equity very often there'll be a board representative. Is this similar? Are you, are you supporting the business in more than just the financial uh, ways? Um, Nigel, do you want to? I'm not trying to dodge the question, but in terms of the amount of support. Uh, so the monitoring officer is there to monitor the progress of the project. Our credit team will look at the quarterly financials. Um, we don't provide um, business support as such, um, but we do want to be supportive to businesses. Can I, can I, can I add something? Oh, the, Joe used to be a monitoring officer. <laughs> not so. from that perspective, but from actually being on the receiving end as a, as a project. It helps you bring some rigor and structure to what you're doing. So, you know, we have a risk register now. We monitor risk. We look at the mitigation of those risks. We do that every quarter. It brings a structure. We've got a project plan that we are mapped against and that we're developing against, um, you know, with, with work, you know, sort of structured with resources against it and time plans that we then report on. 
You know, so it brings um, a, a thinking to the way that you run things that is a discipline that is really good to have. Um, and also with the exploitation planning that you're doing, you're always thinking ahead about how you're actually going to market that product and exploit what you're getting from the project going forward. So it does, having that monitoring officer come, it's like having someone come and it's not they're, they're trying to trip you up or catch you out. They're actually trying to support you to run your project or your, you know, and it obviously spills over into your business as you should do. Um, so it's good practice that they're helping to, you to benchmark yourself against, um, which is really helpful, I, I find. Because we're expecting you to have strong governance as well. So in terms of stage payments, etc., we want to make sure that your project's up to date, yeah? um, that we're satisfied that in terms of looking after the taxpayer's money when we release those funds, it's in accordance with the project. Or subsequently, <coughs> debates about if you slow down, how we can move forward together. And I think one of the things we've been looking at UKBAA, so we deploy some funding across the, um, alongside Innovate UK, across the regions alongside angel investors, is the fact that actually the, by going through the loan process itself, you've gone through some significant technical DD, but also some, some general due diligence, financial um, and uh, officers and directors due diligence as well, actually can, can give some, you know, lay some fears to the rest of some of the equity investors too. So actually, and having that, that stricter process and good corporate governance can be attractive to equity players as well. So it's a double benefit to that for, and we mentioned a bit about leveraging equity between, between and loans, it's, it's, it's crucial as a business to you to take a, a maximum advantage of every single funding option out there and to try and use one to unlock the other where possible. Um, any questions from online? And a question from a gentleman down there, we'll probably make that our last question. Get the microphone over there. Question down there. Uh, thank you. It's probably Nigel uh, um, or Tim. Um, probably Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you switch places? Um, in terms of the security that you take to back the loan, is that share pledges, all assets, IP, um, directors' guarantees? Not personal guarantees. Um, a, a mortgage debenture. So over the overall assets of the company, fixed and floating charge, so that if something goes horribly wrong, we're in a, um, a secured creditor position rather than an unsecured creditor position, and security over assets purchased and IP developed with the proceeds of the loan. So we have security over Tang's super duper machine. Um, and we've been out and looked at it, and it's so cool. <laughs> Uh, and also, uh, Nigel, I might also add about the IP. So, um, uh, Innovate UK does have security over IP, and they they do that not in the spirit of wanting to be evil lender. It's more like I think it's preventing phoenixing. Which yes. Some companies they might have IP it doesn't work. The company goes bankrupt. They switch to another one. So it makes perfect sense. But it's not in the in everything that Innovate UK loans the team. They're personal. They 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 want this to work. They're a complete partner. So it's not like your conventional. And it's the Leonard. emerging IP. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. the IP Developed that emerges with the proceeds from of the, the project, loan. not the IP that you went in with, to be, to be clear. Okay, and, and I presume you subordinate anybody who's existing lenders to the business? Uh, if they are junior lenders, as in shareholders, directors, somebody that's effectively participating in the upside, but has structured their effectively equity investment as debt, um, then we would expect those to be behind us. If um, there's existing commercial um, secured debt or future commercial um, secured debt, then we would enter into a deed of priority with them um, after discussion um, in order to uh, have them as more senior than us in the um, waterfall you know, in the event that something goes horribly wrong. And, and then just a question of cost. So typically, how much would it cost to borrow 500,000 as an upfront payment to lawyers, etc. That would be your responsibility to deal directly with your lawyers. We don't make any charges. We wouldn't, when we, we have a template loan agreement, we have a template security documentation pack. Um, we will cover our own legal costs. Um, it's up to you to cover your legal costs. Please find a great firm uh, and work well with them. We, we know one, so that's okay. Just, okay. I was just wondering if there was a percentage or a typical percentage. No, it's only the interest that you pay. That's it. There's no arrangement fees, no nothing. That's it. Thank you. 
Any questions online? No. Nothing? Uh, it's time for coffee. Great, I think it's time for coffee. Um, thank you very much. Um, can we're going to take... Can I, before we go, just ask for a round of applause from, for, for our fantastic panellists? <laughs> So if we, we're, we're running drastically behind time because that was a really, really useful um, panel discussion and we had some really good questions earlier and I waffle too much. So if we could take, please, until 10 to 12 and then we'll come back. That way we will get the full benefit of Ian um, doing his, things, his um, talk. So if we can grab some coffee, um, come back again um, and another round of applause for the panel and for Rod, thank you very much indeed.
again. appreciate the value of networking and you know that's one of the big things you get out of today isn't it meeting your peers and understanding what they're up to if you're only going to listen to me for one slide I'm going to give you 80% of what I'm talking about now it's quite easy and I want you to think back to when you had exams probably when you were 15 and 17 18 and maybe in your early 20s and the advice you got then holds true now. The advice, if you remember it, was quite simple. The first piece I'm going to give you is answer the question asked. You have 400 words over 10 questions plus a description. And the number of times I look through a grant application, it's the same set of questions as we use on our smart call that we use here in part B. And all 10 answers seem to be repetition of the same, that people don't ask, answer the question asked, but instead they spend their time telling me that their product's great. And the side effects of that is you see low score after low score coming through. The other thing I'm going to remind you of is, just like they said when they said pick up your pencils all those many years ago, don't forget the deadline. You've heard Nigel say it time after time, it's noon. I would urge you to do it the day before, or an hour before, because if you look at the traffic that sits on the server in that final 15 minutes, it shoots up. And if there's a technical reason why you don't hit the deadline, it's your bad news, not ours. And I always find it helpful if you tell people it's the day before, because then when you're three hours late, you've still got 19 hours in hand. Whereas when you tell people this is the true deadline and you miss it, you have a problem. And the final thought I'm going to give you is I want you to consider that the people who are marking this, who are examining it, they're paid £120. And I want you to ask yourself, how much work would I do for £120? And if you're struggling to answer that question, how much does your certified garage mechanic work for £120? Think of that number and then think that they're going to go through 11 a public description and 10 questions. And think of the tempo that some of them, and definitely by no means all of them, but some of them will be reading your answers. And you need to spell out the answers for them to keep it up. So it's quite an easy process. You get the guidance notes, you look at the question, you'll see about five or six bullet points telling you what the answer must have. Copy and paste into your answer, answer each one of them, and then delete the guidance notes. Try and use the same words that you see in the guidance notes, because in their mind, they're looking for those keywords, and when they pick up those keywords, the metaphorical, ooh, struggling that word this morning, red ink makes a tick. Obviously, we're electronic nowadays, and we don't use red ink, but you follow where I'm coming from. And I'm also going to urge you not to underestimate the importance of the, po the project summary. Now, it's not marked, and so people have a tendency to imagine it's unimportant. But this project summary is shared with the assessors to help them select the projects that they want to mark. Now, imagine you're a person who's looking forward to a number of these coming your way, and you're being asked, does your technical skills overlay with this? If you see a project that's easy to answer, you get it straight away, you're more likely to say yes, which means the first choice technical experts are going to be choosing your paper to mark rather than somebody else's. The other element I'm going to get across about the public description is it is published if you're successful. And this is a double-edged sword. On the positive side, of course, it's some marketing material. On the negative side, everybody gets to read it. But I would urge you to consider it to be marketing material 
and give a compelling description for others to enjoy so they can appreciate your successes. Let's now go through the rest of the questions and into the real part of it. And the first one we're going to consider is the gateway question, the school. The people assessing you may not know what you think they should know. So let me illustrate this with a simple example which is now nearly 10 years old. 10 years ago, I was involved with an Innovate UK grant that was targeted for the Harwell Space Campus. The scope question was, are you based on the Harwell campus? And we had companies who were actually based in the European Space Agency incubator, which happens to be on the Harwell campus, writing, I am in the ESA BIC. Unfortunately, the people assessing the paper didn't know where the ESA BIC was located, and they ended up being out of scope. So the scope question was, are you on Harwell? You should have just said, I'm in the ESA BIC, comma, Harwell. You would have been in scope. So just copy the, again, copy out the scope question and put it in and say yes. It's kind of easy. <laughs> Seriously, people trip up on things like that. This is kind of an obvious one, isn't it? Why do we need you? What is the challenge? It is as simple as it says. Tell us what's missing in the market and tell us why you're the people to do it. That's it. We are market-led innovation-centric. That's our funding purpose. We're not doing basic science. We're not doing curiosity-driven research. We're doing stuff to get a product to a marketplace to meet an unmet need. So spell it out, and you'll be away. Now, this slide, the next slide I'm going to share with you, only exists, I'm only going to give you the slide for the first question. That's this one. But it actually exists for all 10 questions, and you can get your hands on it. And I'm just sharing it with you to give you the breakdown of the level of detail that separates you from a 9 or 10 from a 1 or 2. If we were talking about the smart call, to give you an idea of what the marks need to be, you need to be sitting around the 7, 8, 9 mark. The level of competition is so great that unless you're sitting up here on all 10 questions, you're not going to succeed. And unfortunately, getting nine out of nine, getting nine nines, and then dropping one down to a two will ruin you. Every question needs to be at that level, such is the competition. All we want from the approach is just tell us how you're going to take your product, develop your product, and why you can take it to market. So things like patent searches or existing patents that give you that clear water are really helpful. Don't be afraid to include them. And spell out on this one what the innovation is. Innovation is definitely a key word. What is making this unique relative to the marketplace? And a picture goes, is worth a thousand words, as they say. And this will be a great place to put a picture in Appendix 2, showing us how the whole piece pieces together. The need for an A-class team. There is an old cliche that says an A-class team will make a success of a B-class problem. Okay. And a B-class team will waste all your money trying to solve an A-class problem. So we don't want any modesty here. We need to see that you've got the best people there are. Please don't be shy. Tell us why you're awesome and why we should trust you with the money that we're, in this case, lending you. Given that we're doing market-led um, innovation, we expect you to understand the market. Personally, I find bottom-up market analyses much easier to understand than the classic top-down according to a market research report that in 2025 there's going to be billions of pounds across the globe. I think the two key words on this slide are sensible and argued. I don't believe in conservatism, but I do believe in pragmatic. I really don't want to see the classic, if only we got 1%, we have a bright future, because that's relying upon the other side to supply the optimism that you should believe in. So give me sensible, argued numbers, and I would say from the bottom up, makes it very easy for people to believe in you. How are you going to grow your company? And here, 
I would, and why is the customer going to engage with you, the route to market? And here I would be looking at something like the value proposition, the classic five-step value proposition, as being a fantastic tool to use because it explains quite easily in a couple of sentences how you're going to get there. And as always, think simplicity. The other thing I'd say across the whole board is the sort of language you should be doing should be at the new scientist level. Assume an educated reader knows the marketplace, but they most certainly aren't an expert in the field. If you're going more complicated than the new scientist level, and this is for all of the 10 questions, you're overdoing it. Dumb it down. The wider impacts, that's the stuff that isn't directly you. And don't forget that the wider impacts tend to be significantly larger than the impacts on your company. How are you helping society? What are you doing in the region? What are the secondary and tertiary events? Requires you to be a bit creative and then to back up that creativity with facts and then you're away. Project management has to be appropriate for the size of project that you're undertaking. If you're doing a 200,000 project and you tell me you're hiring a fully qualified Prince 7 um, project partitioner to work full time on it, I would probably argue the project management is too big for the project in hand. If you're spending about a million pounds and you tell me you've got a six line Excel spreadsheet that covers all the project details, again, that's probably too light touch. So make sure that the project management is appropriate for the amount of money and for the sector that you work in. Some sectors have a recognized formal approach and it would be pragmatic to use that for your own project as well. Again, you can put a, a Gantt chart if you feel that's appropriate in the appendix for us to refer to. Risks are a beautiful one, aren't they? We want the risks like Goldilocks at the right level. If the project is not risky enough, you'll be told, well, why aren't you using conventional funding? If the project is too risky, you'll be told it's unlikely you'll take your innovation to market. So we expect to see risks. We want to know that A, you can th you've thought about them, and B, you have an answer to start off with. Reality is always different from every project that I, plan that I've ever written, and I expect this to be no different. But if you show that you've thought this through, and you're, at least you're ready for the difficulties ahead, that's a significant step forward. All we want to hear in added value is why Innovate UK are making it possible for you to succeed. Perhaps they're helping you to de-risk the project to allow investors to come further. Perhaps you're going to go to market quicker because you've got, not in the innovation loans, but in the other grants, in the grant side, you've got a consortium that's pulling together the whole supply chain. But spell it out, make it sound great, let's be positive about it. And of course, when has the government never asked for value for money? We want to make sure that this is going to be a useful use of taxpayers' money, and it's good value for money. We get worried when we see too many subcontractors sitting on there, because they're not sharing the risk of the project. But explain how this is a good use of our cash, and it's going to take us somewhere. Small print. <coughs> get this wrong, you'll get rejected too quickly. And actually, I would urge you to use the competition's helpline because A, they respond in a timely manner, and B, their answer is binding. The challenge you have if you ask people like me for an answer is perfectly okay, I'm sure I'll do my best, but it's not as binding as a little email that comes from the competition helpline from me giving you the same answer. And they are surprisingly helpful. I think they have a commitment to do it within 48 hours from memory, and they don't act like bureaucrats is pleasantly surprising. The feedback will be contradictory. Just take it as it is. It's up to you to decide which feedback you take on board and which you can ignore. You tend to see a cluster in the middle with an optimist outlier and a pessimist outlier. And they'll even contradict themselves during the process because they write their feedback independently. So you could quite easily have one person saying, the market looks too small. And on the same, another one reads it and says, the market looks too big. It's just the nature of the beast. These are the several top tips. And 
exactly summarise what I've talked about. Uh, but I think the key tip I would give you, as well as this, if you're going to ask for feedback from the EEN, the catapults, or the KTN, please give us at least a week to respond and that you've got time to wrap that up into your answers. I find it really disheartening when people come to me 48 hours before a deadline going, can you please read this through, offer me some constructive feedback, because you just sit there thinking, there is absolutely no way that they're going to wrap this up into the answers that I give them back. And funnily enough, every man, cat, and dog comes to me in the last 48 hours saying, can you please give me feedback on the project? It's really helpful if you start off the process and you reach out and say, the deadline's four weeks away. I'm planning to get this to you in two and a half weeks because then I can book in half a day for you and I'll keep myself available. And funnily enough, first person asks tends to get, and if you're the second, third, or fourth and I'm busy, that's just the way life is. So get in early and allow us to book up our time. You can download the uh, good application guide that goes with the presentation, contains more information, and helps you to fill out the blanks. It's uh, easily written and easily to get hold of. I'm going to urge you not to forget the whole of the family. So the European Enterprise Network has an unrivaled view. We're all funded via Innovate UK. The EEN has an unrivaled view of a geography. If you want to know what's happening in a geography, the EEN have that view. If you, want to ha if you want to know what's happening by a technical sector, come to the Knowledge Transfer Network, and we have a national view by technical sector. And the catapult is are a national network of centers of excellence. If there's a catapult in your theme, like digital, for example, down opposite British Library, then I would probably say start with the, capital for the catapult first, because they have people and facilities in the sector. And that's what I, <coughs> that's what I would do. If you want to know more about what we're doing, sign up to one of our newsletters and we'll let you know when we're running events and keep you informed and when different funding calls open. Never underestimate the importance of needing to be different. Try and make sure that we understand that you are separated from everybody else and that this is going to add a lot of value. And sometimes that needs you to think and sit down and say, what is it that makes us special? That's it. I believe we've got a few moments for questions, and I'd like to throw it open to the floor. Thank you. Hi, and I've got one from online. Oh, thank um, you. If you're part of a KTN University project, can you use this as well as a loan? This is a loan we're talking about. Sorry, so, I know you're asking online again, and I'm asking please, the wrong please. person. Yeah, so th there's a question from online. Yes. Um, they are part of a KTN University partnership. Yes. And they wonder if this clashes with loans. Oh, does the KTP clash with the loans, I'm guessing, is what they're asking. Uh, does it, Nigel? I can't uh, see why. We'd be reluctant to offer two forms of aid for the same project. If the activities are complementary, um, that might be very, very nice. Just on the uh, feedback point, um, yeah. so does that mean, uh, sorry if you said that and I missed it, but you can actually send in a partially completed or your, your approach to your project to somebody like yourself and get feedback before you submit it? Is that what you mean? Yes, so the EEN, KTN and the Catapults have, will offer feedback subject to them having the resources available. Yeah. And the key sentence is subject to resources available. Yeah. And all um, eligible applications that have gone for assessment, um, feedback will be provided to all applicants, um, successful or unsuccessful, from our assessors. That's, so that's after the event. Yeah. I'm talking about pre, and Nigel's talking post. Talk to them first. It's always a good thing to do. So you showed us one brief snippet of the Mark scheme. Is yeah. that publicly available, what you'll be marking all of them to. Sorry, I think it wasn't clear whether you said that that would be or wouldn't be. It is publicly available. It is available. Google is your friend. Okay. The assessor guidance, Yeah, it's out there. Okay. We don't typically send it out as part of No, this. that's why I say Google's your friend. You can find it.
Are there any considerations around de minimis as well? The state aid. Uh, this is notified state aid under um, Article 25 of the General Block Exemption Regulations. It's not de minimis. De minimis is different. Hi, sorry if this is a slightly nerdy question, but um, in our software design, uh, under we do follow agile methodologies uh, with a very emergent design. So we have a roadmap of where we're going, and then we follow um, uh, the design of the application works through the development of the project, and we reach minimal via project. You don't have a Gantt. That's, not That's how okay. It works. I'll just give Gantt as an example. As long as you have a methodology and you explain it, just make sure that you've got to think somebody who's spending a certain amount of time quickly understanding what you're saying, is it clear and understandable? And Gantt is just one approach. I mean, okay, thank you. Maybe it's a bit old school. Yeah. Okay, I think Brilliant. we're done. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Ian. you. Next, because someone said, um, can we have some more technical credity stuff? Um, Scott's going to talk about how we think about the business side of things. So if you remember back, we're saying you have to talk about your project and you have to talk about your business. The part A that's on IFS is about the project. Ten questions, plus question 11 that's not scored. Ian's taking you through that. Part B, the business survey around early metrics and the business financials is about the business. Is it a sensible lending proposition? Scott, who's our head of lending operations and risk, is going to talk you through our approach to that. Over to you, Scott, and then I'll wrap up. Yeah. Thanks, Nigel. What they actually said was we need another boring banker on the stage. So boring banker number three. Uh, of, of the uh, afternoon. So, um, as Nigel said, Ian's taking you through what makes a good project application. I'm just going to talk to you about how we approach credit. And really, it's not very different to how anyone else has ever appro approached credit in the entire history of, of lending. So, oh, slides have changed slightly, Nigel. You did send them around. I know, I just hadn't looked at them. Um, so, That's why I sent you the slide deck saying there's a new slide, Scott. So... <laughs> We, we've talked to you around this question of why do you need public money? The idea that, you know, is, is it um, you've got revenue generating, you have operational projects, you have some surplus cash, you have additional equity could be raised up front. Do you actually need our support? We are not. We're, we're a funny balance. We're not there to replace commercial finance. Neither are we the lender of last resort. Uh, we are not there to, to pull people up out of you know, absolute despair and desolation uh, and to give them general working capital to keep them going for another few months. Um, we are looking for things that have a reasonable prospect of commercial success um, and where that is, is um, driven through the innovations that you're bringing to market. Um, we talked about are you innovative and actually if you answer the questions um, well in, in that way that Ian's just described, we'll see some of that stuff. Um, are you highly innovative? So again, that, that question of is there a credible story here? And the credibility of the story applies both to the, the project piece around the innovation, but we want to see a, a credible story for the business piece as well. So, Ian talks about do you have a good project team, and that and, you know an A class uh, team makes a B, uh, can take a B class innovation forward and make it a success. The same is true of the management team of the business more generally. Uh, and I guess within the portfolio so far, what we've seen um, a, a range of, a range of teams. So you, you have people who are highly skilled technologists uh, who know their product inside out, will definitely make the innovation work. Could they bring it to market? That's more challenging. And actually what we see then is we have people who say, I've recognized that and I'm bringing in a commercial sales director or actually I'm becoming the CTO and bringing in a CEO to actually drive the growth of the business. And that's a real positive for us in terms of how we make that assessment around around the team. And it's almost a more of an equity approach at that point rather than a, a traditional debt provider approach. We're happy to take that sort of future shaping uh, into our decision making. Um, same applies to the capital piece. So Nigel talked about are you sufficiently capitalised? Um, you don't have to be sufficiently capitalised at the point of application, but knowing what your strategy is to get to the point where you have sufficient capital to drive your business forward and to grow it and to take on the level that you're looking for it is really important. And again, it's the credible narrative around that. So here is our funding strategy. This is how we're going to achieve that. 
these are the people that are going to be achieving that, and here's evidence that they know what they're doing. That sort of thing makes a really good, coherent narrative. And having an adequate funding strategy is a really good start to this piece. So the actual decision-making process. Um, you will now fit in Part B through Early Metrics, uh, which is a range of questions designed to sort of tease out uh, your business plan, uh, your plan for growth, how you're going to drive this forward, what your funding approach is, where you are in your development process, and to give our credit team some hard numbers or relatively soft numbers, but hopefully numbers that make sense uh, in a forward-looking cash flow, in a forward-looking P&L and balance sheet. What we see um, are good applications where people have really thought about that, where they have assumptions which are justified, where they've mapped those out, where they might have more than one uh, set of cash flows, one that's looking at what they expect to achieve, one that's looking at what you know the gold standard and some of the uplands might look like, and also what's the minimum they might have to achieve to repay and service the debt. Seeing all three of those fills my credit team with absolute joy and hope because they see it so rarely, it puts them in a good mood from the first point. Uh, and we talked about the time that the assessors have. Um, Two members of the credit team currently look at about 100 applications in about 15 working days. So you can imagine how they feel about really good applications versus those that they really have to wrestle to get the detail and get the numbers out. Uh, and that will go into informing their recommendations that come to the credit committee of myself, Nigel, and Tim, uh, who was up on stage earlier. And what they bring to the credit committee is a, a one of four recommendations. So there's a straightforward recommend. Yes, this looks financially plausible to us. There's a sensible plan. It looks like a good team. We think we should take this one forward. Uh, they have a straight decline, which is this is the maddest thing of all the mad things that we've seen. And we've seen plenty of pretty mad things come through. Um, and there's no way on earth that we would touch this with a barge pole, even not having met the individuals. Uh, and then you have a, a group in the middle of either marginal recommends, where you know, this feels about right. There's probably something there. It could probably do with a bit more work, and we, but we think there's, it's worth going out to see these people and having that conversation. And the marginal clients, where we think actually it seems slightly implausible, but actually if it's really, really good tech, it's probably worth going to go and have that conversation with them. And that's because there is a bias within our process, a slight bias towards the quality of the innovation as being the thing that drives us and that gets us out of bed in the morning. And what you see here is how that translates through into a decision uh, from the back of the credit committee and into what we, we have a, a, a progress panel. Uh, panel. Um, so if it's recommended and the innovation is above our quality line, so Nigel's probably mentioned the 70%, I might have missed it, um, it will go through to detailed assessment at that point. Uh, if it's marginal and it's in the top 20, sorry, top 75% of things above that line, it will go through. If it's a marginal decline from a credit point of view, but it's in the upper quartile, so it's really, really high scoring, We'll take it through to have a better look. Anything else, anything that's below the quality line, anything that's a decline, uh, or anything that isn't in either that top quartile or the top 75% for marginal recommends, will not go through. And that's the point where we draw a line and start the process. You will, however, all get feedback. So you will get the feedback in the comments of the innovation assessment and feedback from the credit team. And we have seen people come back to us with second applications who've taken that on board, who've addressed that within their applications, and have actually gone on to detail analysis, and actually gone on to secure offers from us. We've also seen people who've come back and made no changes whatsoever, and it becomes a very short conversation at that point. So, credit. Uh, how do you tell a convincing story? So, we talked about credit never having really changed, and, and essentially, whether you take the, the five Cs of credit that's up there on the right, um, or, or the more detailed uh, flow, which is one that actually comes out of our, our lending manual on the left, we're trying to understand what is the character of the business and the people within it. So that is typically in a banking sense, that's credit history, and it's a likely commitment to repay. Um, so we will look at things. We will look at public records around CCJs, PEP, sanctions, various other bits and pieces, lending track record that's in there. I guess the one thing I'd say is there are no absolute red flags within our process. So if there's a CCJ for £35 for a missed parking ticket and that's explained and you recognise that, you know, that's unlikely to get in the way of a million pound deal to a good company. 
but what it is is a little indicator of potential issues around credit control uh, and uh, just control within the business more generally, and we will want to start digging into that. So if you know what your profile is, if you know what's out there in, in the background, then tell us. Be upfront about it. It makes life a lot easier, and it starts to address the questions as we go through and give us some confidence. We talked about the management team and people, and we're looking for the business there. So it's, it's around the ability of the business as a whole to manage its risks, to understand its financial position, to plan its financial position. So that, that one's quite interesting. We, we tend not to get businesses that have full-time CFOs. Um, if you've got one, great. Um, but it's probably best not to hand this off to your bookkeeper and ask them to just make up some numbers. So you know, there, there is definitely value in bringing expertise into each part of your application to have more than one person pulling this together. But where your CEO is driving a strategy which says in the business plan you're going to do X, and then your outsource bookkeeper is saying, and these are the numbers, and those two things don't tally, it just raises that question in, in your mind and immediate, immediately when you're doing this really quite quick and dirty analysis at the front end. Uh, and what you're trying to give yourself here is the ability to get past that first bit when we don't come out and talk to you. Once we're talking to you, as a conversation is a much easier process at that point. Thorough, but easier. So you need to convince us at this point. Liquidity. So cash is king in all credit. Um, so we want to understand how much cash is in the business and whether you think the loan is affordable. And I'd like to think that, you know, if you put together your cash flow and it shows you the loan isn't affordable, maybe don't apply for a loan. Or maybe reconsider your funding strategy. We see plenty of applications that essentially say, I can't afford this, please give me a million pounds. Well, no, <laughs> frankly. Um, and again, that's the question, you know, we give the same level of detail around our feedback on every case. I'd like to stop having to comment on cases where I'm saying, there's nothing here. You haven't given us any information. You know, better quality, better self-reflection at the front end really helps you get through that process. We have a ready reckoner available um, through the application process, so you can look out what your interest and debt service costs are going to be. You can look at the sort of coverage ratios you're going to be able to achieve. Do I have enough cash? Will my P&L support this? When I get to the point of repayment, will I have scaled my business enough to service this debt? Uh, we're interested in leverage. Nigel says we can do up to 100%. It's absolutely right. More typically, we do about 70% because people recognize that there is a need to bring additional cash into this transaction, whether you're raising it, whether you're putting your own funds towards it. Now, that element of skin in the game is a... As a boring banker, skin in the game is always uh, a beneficial thing um, when I'm looking at an application. And if I see your commitment alongside our commitment, that makes me feel much more comfortable. We talked about funding plans, so sources of additional capital. And look at your balance sheet. Can your balance sheet sustain this level of debt? Do you need to raise funding? And we'll come on to undertakings in difficulty at the moment. Well, I, I know that Nigel's mentioned this, and last time we were here, Tang gave a uh, an explanation which was far better than anything I've ever <laughs> uh, managed to say, so I'll try and remember as much of that as possible. Uh, market as well. So Joe talks about the importance of understanding the market positioning, your resilience to economic trends within the market. Um, I normally make a joke here about Halloween, but I guess I might not be able to do that anymore. If something were to happen around Halloween or maybe slightly later or in 2023, um, you might want to show that you've considered that and planned for that and understood the impacts of that um, on your business. Um, your competitors. We see wonderful slides where um, there's a competitor analysis and no matter what happens, the company that we're being asked to support always wins. Uh, a realistic competitor analysis is always a good thing to see around this. Realism, pragmatism, being practical and being sensible about the things you're putting forward and telling that convincing story to us. Uh, political and regulatory risk will depend on, on your particular situation and what you're doing. But if you're exporting to a market that you know is a particular challenge, or where you know that it's hard to protect your IP, or where you know there's regulatory change coming down the line. Recognising that, seeing it, mentioning it, explaining your mitigation and your control, again, builds confidence at this stage. And all that goes into the, the evidence around control culture. So uh, Ian's talked about project risks. The risks facing the business, there's also an opportunity to talk about that as well within the application process. And knowing that you'll be able to identify what you spent that you've spent it on the right things and can justify it back to us tends to be really helpful. Undertakings in difficulty. Um, I could just let you read it because it's probably self-explanatory. Um, it appears not to be, generally. Uh, so, the undertaking in difficulty test is a test of 
whether your accumulated losses exceed more than half of your subscribed share capital. And it's a pass-fail test. Uh, it applies at the point of commitment, so you can certainly apply if you're in undertaking a difficulty, um, but you need to have a plan to mitigate that issue. And that would need to be completed before we do the first drawdown on the loan. Nigel's mentioned um, some of the ways that you might think around, around this issue. So if you're under three years old, it doesn't apply. Um, interestingly, if you were applying for risk finance or a different article of GBO, that would be seven years. And it would be much easier. But it's three years for us, and there's not much we can do about that. Um, if your most recent financial accounts say that you are an undertaking difficulty, but actually you've raised capital since then, give us your management accounts. Show us that the position has changed. Make it easy for us to make that, that judgment. Um, the credibility of plans for the raise, or for the change of accounting practice, or for the conversion of directors' loans, or however your professional advisors and you decide that you're going to mitigate the, that test, setting those out up front helps us nod it through. It makes it an easier thing to, to address. Uh, and Nigel's already mentioned uh, deferral of liabilities and various other potential options there. But we can't give advice, so go and get some proper advice um, from some professionals. I'm just wondering if it's worth stopping on that slide for a moment. Are there any specific questions on undertakings and difficulty? Yeah, that's one over there. Sorry, I didn't give you any warning on that at all, um, Lindsay. What's, what's the definition of Sorry. Sorry. What's the definition of the start point for the business? Is it it's the day, of trading? The, the day it is established. So, so the day it is incorporated at a company's house would be the day. So you could be dormant for three years and you're out of it. Yeah. So um, again, within the risk finance guide, it's within seven years of first commercial sale. That could be 10, 15 years, couldn't it? Um, that would be a much help, more helpful definition. And funny enough, we have mentioned this to the Commission and others uh, alongside other innovation agencies across Europe. Uh, it's uh, not an ideal test, but it's one that we have to apply. Okay. So, initial credit triage, is it plausible? Is it effectively the, the um, summation of those four points there? Um, the innovation assessment, you know, what's, what's the score around of 100 on the basis of that, that marking schema that um, both Ian and Nigel have mentioned? We then get to line draw. So we actually have one on Monday. Um, where we bring together the innovation score and the, the initial credit judgment. And from that, we go back to that sort of red and green chart that we had before, and we make a decision. Um, if it's not going to go ahead, we get the no out to you as quickly as we can, and we get you some feedback uh, around both the innovation piece and the credit score. If it's a yes, we're going to progress it and look at it in more detail. You will get a note from the credit analyst who has looked at your application, and they will be the individual who takes you all the way through this process, and actually all the way beyond this process and continues to support you through the relationship function that we have. Um, that will set out areas that the credit committee has flagged uh, for further information or for having a look, and generally we'll come out and see you, um, which is why I, I've managed 50,000 miles since February 2018 um, and visited more small trading estates than I would care to remember. Um, as to where they were, I'm not entirely sure. I've sort of lost, lost entirely where I am now. We also spend an awful lot of time in we work spaces, don't we, Joe? Uh, so. Oops. so, subject to that detailed analysis, and it will be a nice rigorous process, you should feel uh, both tested and feel like you're getting something positive out of that process as well. Um, you may receive a conditional loan offer. Um, that is always subject to a management presentation to the credit committee. So myself, Tim, Nigel, coming out and seeing the business in its location, because its location is not typically our office in Swindon, which is always a bonus. Um, so we will come and see you in situ. We want to understand about your project, but we want to understand about your wider business. Go to a management presentation, and the first three hours is taken up with explaining how cool your technology is, and then there's one slide at the end with some numbers on it, that tends to not be a successful management presentation. We have declined people at that stage. Three? Two? Three times? Certainly two. Certainly two. Three. Probably should have been three. <laughs> um, so we have gone to those meetings and thought, oh my God, why did we agree to lend to this lot and withdraw the offer? So it does happen. Um, it's also really a good chance for you to test that pitch narrative that you might then take to your equity investors further down the line. Because uh, you'll get Nigel and I being grumpy at you. Uh, Tim will probably question you on sales in a way that we wouldn't have done. 
um, and governance and everything else. So it should feel like a good workout for the business and a good test of your, of your pitch. Uh, then standard form loan agreement, which um, Nigel has already mentioned. We do all your normal stuff that you might get around the bank onboarding, so know your customer, anti-money laundering, politically exposed persons, all that sort of stuff, which is done by our lending administration partner, which is growth company business finance based up in Manchester, uh, and the various corporate, corporate authorizations. So whereas in a grant, the project manager can happily sign the agreement and free money arrives, and why would the board be upset with that? Uh, we like to see proper board resolutions in place. We like to know that the directors of the company are understanding what they're getting into and that this isn't success contingent. You do have to repay it regardless of the outcome of the project. Um, the good thing about that is it's all done electronically. So KYC AML is all done just by uploading documents to the site. We have legal e-sign in place, so electronic signatures on documents and so on. Unless you're one of those really high-tech companies that doesn't like um, software signatures and they want everything in triplicate and hard copy on paper by post. Uh, yeah, and then they say, and we're really highly technical. And yeah. One of the funniest things in management presentations is always that how many technologists in the room and none of them can ever get PowerPoint to work. <laughs> it takes about 15, 20 minutes to get it up on the screen. Um, once you've got your loan, um, first drawdown. We will. We are not tied to the same process that Innovate would normally follow within this. Um, so it doesn't have to be on the first of a month. It's when you're ready. The project starts when you receive your first drawdown, and that will be agreed between you and the credit specialist who takes your, your deal through to execution, working with Cara at the back, who's our lending operations manager, who, who will deal with that sort of paperwork and, and, cap, and cash out the door. Um, we are shifting the process slightly around monitoring visits, we are trying to move the initial baselining slightly forward in the process. So in a grant competition, you have your baseline and then you start your project. Uh, what we have been doing is um, drawing down and then having the baseline meeting and second, setting the second uh, drawdown. We're trying to bring that baselining closer to the front end of the project, just because I think it helps you and it helps us understand what the cash flow requirements are going forward. But essentially, once all the conditions are met, um, you submit a drawdown notice, we review that, and we pay away. Subsequent drawdowns, you'll have a monitoring officer come out to see you to understand what you've done in the previous quarter and what you plan to do in the next quarter. Um, you submit a drawdown request, and as long as the monitoring officer likes where you're going and what you're doing, and our credit specialist is happy with the financial progress of the business, the next drawdown comes down. And then the interest is applied quarterly in arrears, 3.7% running during the availability and extension period, 3.7% deferred, not compounding, and added to the principal at the point that you reach the end of the extension period. So the extension period is no further drawdowns, but you're getting on with doing your commercialization. We're saying here, when you're applying and you're doing your point B, uh, part B and you're mapping out your uh, intended cash flows and spend and your intended P&Ls, it's wonderful when you see an extension period that lasts two years, but you hit commercial sales within nine months of the beginning of the project, and by the end of that point, you're hitting sort of 7 million turnover with 4 million EBITDA. But you're saying to us, but I still need a few more years to commercialize this, then I need a full five years of repayment. We tend not to believe that, and we will come back and negotiate that with you. So be realistic at that outset uh, around that. Repayment period, no further drawdowns, not a, not a, a, a revolving facility. Uh, repayment principal and interest at 7.4%. Quarterly, straight line repayment. Uh, but you continue to be monitored by your credit specialist at that point. So you'll have the monitoring officer all the way through the availability and extension period, um, but you'll just keep your credit specialist for the repayment period. And if they're sufficiently unenthusiastic, it might even be the same one that's taken you through um, the first five years of life as a business. Or hopefully they've, they've grown and, and moved up in the world and, and there'll be some new people, but we'll try and give you some continuity around that uh, as you go through. That's it. Back to Nigel. Um, all the questions for if Scott I, first. Which Nigel will answer, but yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much for those presentations. It's been a really helpful morning. Um, I've got a question about the quantum of mm. the loans. If the average is about 700,000 to date, it's suggesting you prefer maybe upper limits towards the million rather than Not lower scale? Or is there any way to suggest that people, more people have applied for large loans than for small loans? We are indifferent as to size. We to will be, lend between £100,000 and a £1,000,000 based on what your project needs. 
Yeah. Um, we won't say, well, I'd much rather do an 800 one rather than a 250 one. That's not Which how I, we work. I suppose I just wanted to test that because it'd be much easier for you to have 10 at a million than 100 at 100,000, say, in terms of your management and being able to cover it. Uh, it, may, it, it may be easier. So that, that whole drift up market, so, you know, 3i come into the market, they start doing small ticket deals, they move to the right as they become more commercial, and now they don't do small deals. You know, it's, it's very tempting to think, well, if I just do 10 £1 million deals, that's a damn sight easier uh, and less effort. But we're not driven by that same commercial consideration. You know, we're there to address the gap in the market. There's a gap in the market equally for companies needing 200000 to do their first piece of work to doing a million for, for doing that. So everyone gets the same amount of attention. Everyone gets the same amount of time and effort. And it's just the way the process is designed. I actually had, have to ask our competitions team to tell me how much people want to borrow because they don't think that's a consideration that we should be thinking about. Um, but it's quite hard then to judge you know, what should the adequate capitalisation of a business balance sheet look like. Uh, but it's certainly it's not fundamental to the effort that goes into the application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you. I also found this morning very useful. Um, question about the eligibility for loans. What, what can you borrow money for? For example, is the interest on the loan? No. Nope. That was easy one. No. <laughs> um, admin costs in the business? Or yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, as long as they're linked to the actual eligible costs of the project, then you can claim for staff and salary and, and stuff like that. But it needs to be directly related, and then there is the 20%. So there is a, an allowance for overheads, and there's a, two ways of doing that. Either there's a fixed percentage of your general admin costs towards a project, or you can schedule out specific admin costs of delivering the project. And they're your two, two options. So rent and VAT and all that stuff? So in the guidance for applicants, if you look on the Innovate UK website, there is a definition of eligible project costs, and it's, and it's in this slide deck, and we'll send it round to you. I'm not going through and reading out the instructions because that's boring for everyone. Labour, relating to the project. Overheads, either 20% of your labour costs or actuals, um, materials that you may be spending money on, usage of capital equipment in the project, and we can be really boring about that and his worked example, um, some subcontractors, if they're eligible and justified and appropriate and blah, 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 um, travel and subsistence, but not for marketing, um, other costs that don't fit anywhere else, IP protection up to £7,500, these are your eligible project costs, these things are typically not eligible. Tax, interest, um, profits in subcontractors and subsidiaries or blah, 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 um, etc. Contingencies and, uh, and, and a bit added on just for fun. That's not an eligible, it's not defined. So it's the cost of the R&D project directly. That's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll read that with interest. Um, <laughs> the... Next question is about the projections, the cash flow projections that you'd yep. like to see. Um, my guess is there'd be a management case, there'd be a base case, and there'd be a sensitivity case. That would so, be sensible. Right. In fact, like that, that would be incredible if That'd you could be do way that. Way beyond what most people do. <laughs> oh, we'll try and do them all. Um, so my guess is you'll be financing the base case with one eye looking at the downside case, and the downside case should reflect the risk section, I guess, with some probability, expected outcomes, that sort of stuff. Is, is that fair? So, if there is a coherence between what you're planning to do and your central case, and that shows that you can service the debt, that, that sounds ideal. If you show a sensitised case where, you know, the world has blown up and all the wheels have fallen off, everything, um, would we expect you to still be able to service the debt and meet our minimum ratios from that? I don't think that's entirely essential because we're, we're there, we have to take some credit risk within this. Otherwise, we just do what the banks are doing. So we want to understand what your downside is and what your mitigations are for that. We accept that we are going to be taking a high degree of credit risk and a high degree of innovation risk. So you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that we, we judge it on, on a sensitised case. It's likely to be closer to the to the um, central estimate, but you know, seeing that and that, understanding that you've acknowledged that and you've put plans in place to address that would be confidence building from, a, from, a, from our point of view. And in terms of what we finance, how much we finance, we finance the actual case. So 
if in your project you said we, it's going to cost a million pounds, if it turns out that it costs 750,000 pounds and 706 pence, that's what we'll fund. Hmm. Because each quarter, you draw down quarterly in advance, you reconcile with the project, ma uh, the project monitoring officer at the end of the quarter. If you've drawn down money and not spent it on eligible project costs, then um, that'll be either, if it's a small amount carried over to the next quarter, if it's a big chunk of money, then we'll reduce the drawdown for the next quarter because we can't fund beyond the eligible project costs that are incurred and defrayed in your project because it's public money, it's state aid governed, so it, we will fund the actual project amounts. Um, how your business does, hopefully it's at the top end of expectations and you'll be very happy and easy to repay or we'll have a yeah, fun conversation about things being difficult. Thank you. Um, I, I know that the primary focus is innovation. Um, how much weight do you give to ESG considerations, which is current fad? Uh, maybe it's, it's more than that, but... I wouldn't call it fad. Well, but it's, it's, let's, let's I, say it's at the beginning. Um, how much weight do you put on ESG? Okay, so... Um, no, well, it sounds like you're about to. So, <laughs> Ian, Ian showed you that. We, we asked you ten questions. Included in those ten questions is one around wider, wider impacts. That's where environmental, social uh, concerns come in. So please answer those. So that's 10% of the uh, marks around the innovation. When it comes to governance, when it comes to opportunity, when it comes to the character of the business, um, if everybody looks and thinks just like me um, and is a boring, pale, male, stale bloke from Surrey, then we might think that as a, as a management team there's maybe something lacking. But there isn't a specific percentage allocated to ESG as such. Thank you. That's me. Uh, I think Emily's got some online. Yeah. Um, I've got three, if that's okay. Um, so just to clarify... Our currently company is currently in receipt of R&D tax credits each year. Does this mean we would not be eligible to apply for either a loan or a grant? No, it doesn't mean that. Um, all that we say is that you can't have two forms of state aid for the same project. So if you are claiming uh, R&D tax credit at the small company rate, that is a form of state aid. Um, so if you were looking to fund the same projects with grants or with loans, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, you should go and get some tax advice. It's always the answer. Um, what you're not necessarily precluded from is claiming R&D tax relief at the large company rate, which isn't a form of state aid on those project costs. But I can't give you tax advice, so please go and get some professional tax advice. Thanks. Okay, the next one is, there's been some um, questions around the guidance for applicants around the grant equivalent. Obviously, innovation loans can fund up to 100% of eligible project mm -hmm. costs but could you just expand on the 45% and the 35% grant equivalent? So, so the, the aid on an innovation loan arises from the differential between the price that you pay for it and the market rate. So that's both the interest rate and the fees that are applied or, or not applied uh, in our case. So we are comfortable or confident that um, anyone applying for a million pound loan who is likely to be um, within our credit risk appetite is likely to... Uh, receive less than 45% state aid benefit on a, on a, on a, um, a gross grant equivalent basis uh, for their project costs. So essentially we stay within the 45%, but that is measured against the gross grant equivalent within the loan, which is a differential between the pricing of the loan and uh, what you would be able to get in the market. The way that we calculate the, the market rate is to take the uh, credit risk rating that we apply to the business, which is a combination of expert judgment, Moody's, uh, various other bits and pieces that come together, public sources of data, um, and we map that across onto reference rate tables, which are published by the European Commission, um, which include their view on what a market pricing in the UK would be. So essentially, you shouldn't have a problem. <laughs> Uh, if you are a bad enough credit risk that you might have a problem because the, the commercial rate would be so high, the likelihood is you probably wouldn't get a deal from us anyway. Thanks. Final one for me. Yeah. Um, is there a timetable for loans next year? What, what, what's next year? 2020. <laughs> yeah, living, living hand to mouth. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I understand that there is uh, likely to be a fiscal event, perhaps sometime in November, 
at which um, the future funding of various government programs may be revealed. And that may be why the meeting Nigel and I had with an official from the Treasury later is, is no longer happening, because they're busy working out what the answers are to those questions. Yeah. Um, so um, that's a very good question. I'd love to know the answer. I think Nigel and I are hopeful that we will have funding going into next year and for the rest of the SR period um, to expand the program to continue to, to do this, because we think it works. There's one here. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, just in terms of the percentages, I, I did read your guidelines, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the answer. Is it just the availability period that the percentage applies to, or is it the, can the project also ex go through the extension and commercialisation period? Uh, so the, we define the project as the availability period plus the extension period, the availability period being the bit when you're drawing down the money and, and doing the sort of highly innovative techie stuff, and the, the extension period is designed to cover getting that to market, so building out your business model and so on. We don't draw down within that commercialization period, but likelihood is that as part of your project, maybe you're doing your marketing spend and various other things there, which we can't fund in any case. So if you have a three-year availability period and a two-year extension, we see that as a five-year project. So when you're thinking about, for example, capital usage, you can apply five years to that. And maybe if you, your asset has a, you know, depreciates over five years, potentially you could carry, and does 100% of its work in the project, you could potentially borrow up to 100% of that upfront um, of the depreciation cost, or sorry, the cost of the use of that project upfront in order to fund that. Thank you. And support your project. Oh, sorry, there's one over there quickly first, sorry. Um, earlier this morning, with the November application timetable, it was suggested that it might be in April, May, drawdown, but I think a panellist almost inferred that they got their money within three months. Uh, we have moved faster. And so we, we've definitely managed to move quicker, and actually for both Kalali and for, for Bubble, um, we moved a damn sight faster. Um, a lot of that sort of depends on uh, the conditionality attached to it, so if it's contingent on an equity raise or it's contingent on something else or the diligence process takes longer or there are key hires, then it might well take longer. We have turned around, I'm looking at Joe, I'm trying to remember, it was something like six days from credit decision to drawdown, which is just daft, to be honest, Joe. I don't know how we did that. Um, that was because it was Joe. It's because it was Joe. <laughs> yeah, um, so we can move faster. We'd love for the project to start faster because we want to get capital out the door. We want to get it working rather than just sitting in our bank account. Um, I think not one I just given you is a realistic time scale of the sort of typical average client moving through the process, maybe having to be chased for information, that sort of thing, which does happen. So there's one here. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, could you just let me know uh, for um, lending decisions and uh, visiting our place? Hmm. Uh, if at the time, um, I mean, this would be after confirmation, it would be after, uh, you know, loan confirmation or no, it would be before you make, uh, I mean. So, so typically a credit specialist may come out to see you while they're doing their detailed analysis and sometimes either Nigel or I will tag along with them. Um, that tends to happen pretty quickly after that, after the initial decision to progress. Yeah. Um, the management presentation is after the credit committee has met to take their final decision off the back of that detailed analysis. So for example, if our places, I mean, there's a manufacturing uh, yeah, yeah. You know, line, so, and, uh, you know, they come in that we're going to design, it would be, I mean, um, we need that money to come, and then after that we can start. So maybe our yeah, office will be available, but our manufacturing line is not, you know, that's place, fine. So, so if what you're showing is a factory with the space where you're going to put your, your production line, that, yeah. that's fine. We want to understand the, the context that. that you're operating. Yeah, we've seen worse than that, to be honest. Um, you know, yeah. um, I'm still giving them the money. Um, there's a wonderful company, wasn't there? Where well, are they? In the Wirral. And yeah. it, essentially, um, they, they, they have a process for, for um, removing uh, slag from aluminium recycling so you can get efficiency yeah, up. Slightly up towards 100%, nearly 100% of all aluminium recycled rather than having to landfill this stuff. The prototype they built, they made by travelling around various industrial estates, picking up pieces of old equipment, yeah. re-engineering them and then clamping them together. This thing looks so Heath Robinson, you've never seen anything like it. Um, but, you know, it showed that they'd taken the concept, they'd proven, proven their concept. It was in a barn, essentially of a warehouse with dirt everywhere and it was, it was fantastic. And Nigel got to wear a pink Hivers jacket, so that made it even better. 
Okay. So, you know, you do, we're not expecting shiny, polished stuff. In fact, if you've got shiny and polished stuff, maybe you've already you know, passed the point where, you know, who knows? It's nice to see shiny occasionally, but uh, not necessary. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Um, in terms of uh, the state of the business, so you, you, towards the end of what you were talking about, you are talking about profit. So if a company is already profitable, mm -hmm. but looking at a new line or a new market, yeah. is that okay? It's fantastic, yeah. It would okay. be lovely to see something profitable. And then, so, <laughs> so if there's aspects of the business which, which would continue to be profitable, but the project, obviously is mm -hmm. a new project, and it itself, if it was on its own, wouldn't necessarily be profitable, obviously, mm -hmm. until the future. Do you look yeah. to see that separated out? Yeah, so no, no so it's, it's a loan to the business. So if there are other revenue streams and there's other profits, that's great. What you need to prove it to us is why it's additional. So why can't the rest of the business just get access to the funding? It may be because the innovation risk is too high or the project risk is too high. That's fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, seeing other lines that are doing well is, is quite positive as far as we're concerned. Thanks. Nope. Hi. Um, I think you implied that uh, you are willing to fund some offshore software development. Uh, we, we have funded things where there are subcontracting overseas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, provided there's good justification. Yeah. Is because it's cheaper a good justification? <laughs> well, that, that's quite a good business argument, isn't it? Um, so, we can't specify that stuff must happen in the UK. So, that would be against the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union for a start. And actually, it may not be the best answer for for your business. So if there is a justified case that the expertise exists elsewhere in a way that uh, at a price level it, is, it doesn't apply in the UK, then there's, if there's a sensible business rationale around that, I don't think we're going to be quite as, um, what should we say, dogmatic as, as we might be in other settings. Nigel's looking like he might disagree with me on this. I, I quite like seeing business efficiencies delivered because it helps deliver your profitability and it helps to get us repaid. Um, if it were, we've given you the money and 100% of it immediately goes to the Ukraine, then, well, I, I might ask Mr. Giuliani to investigate. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, one here. I think Cara's going to win. Yeah. Thank you, Cara. Uh, just a quick one. Um, so the business plan, is that seen by just the credit team or the credit team and assessors? Uh, you can attach it to part so, A, can't you? Yeah, so you can attach a Summary of your business plan or a slide deck is question 11 in part A. That will be seen by the assessors. The business survey and your business financials will only be seen by the credit team and not by the assessors. Because they focus on the project, we focus on the project and the business. Okay. I feel like we might already be in the wrap-up. No, sorry, it's one more question here, and then I think we'll let Nisa let Nigel move There's on a point that you referenced just now, and I think it's in the documentation, about um, proving that the loan would not be available from alternative sources. Yeah. What's the standard of proof for that? Because that could take a long uh, time. A, 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 a narrative that makes sense. So we don't expect to be able to see a bank decline letter. Um, they don't exist. Um, well, they do exist, I'm told, but I've never seen one. Uh, I didn't issue many either. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a story, a credible narrative around what you've done to try and attract finance from the market and what the response has been. We appreciate that people will sometimes be discouraged rather than declined, uh, and there are enough old bankers sitting around the table to, I think, recognise when somebody's having a bit of a spurious pop because it's cheap rather than because um, they genuinely can't get bank finance. And I think we, we, we say demonstrate the need for public funding rather than prove um, that you have been rejected elsewhere. Hmm. I, I know we say that because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a smart man. Okay, um, Nigel, should we swap places? You can do your wrap-up. And, and there's one, one question oh, sorry. coming in there. <laughs> well, let me Thank out. you. Uh, so the question is, like, if, if I'm putting a, uh, an application, application through... Um, is the value of loans set in stone, like, um, for example, the last stages of um, application, when the process is more iterative, uh, will you come and say back, saying, okay, you know, you've applied for a half a million loan, but we are happy to take a credit risk on 400,000, so can you yeah. reduce it down to 400? So there will be, we have the opportunities, the credit committee, to negotiate around the terms of the offer. Okay. Um, 
funnily enough, the two cases I can think of, we've actually offered people more money than they've asked for. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Because they've, they've underestimated um, potentially the cost of their projects, or actually That's in one case what they, they underestimated was how much of their own cash they would need to put towards a marketing effort to get their product to market. And we said instead of making a contribution to the eligible cost, take that money, put that in as an earlier contribution towards your marketing and ineligible activities that we can't fund, and we will fill that gap by funding more of the eligible costs. Um, we've done that at least twice. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's a negotiation at that point. Okay. okay I'm going to run away. Thank you very much, Lee Scott. Right, I'm going I'm to wrap up quickly. Um, a reminder of the dates. Um, 12 noon on the 27th of November. Please don't be late. Um, remember, part A is about your project. Part B is about your business. Both of them matter to us. <clears throat> part A, you apply through the Innovation Funding Service in this competition. Part, te- part B, through the Early Metrics um, online survey. This is the process as a reminder. IFS for part A, 11 questions, and your project finances. Part B, early metrics, the survey around the um, high growth startup index, and your business financials. <clears throat> and then it goes through for assessment, evaluation, progress, potentially, and then detailed credit analysis, and then hopefully a loan offer. Um, these are the questions. Um, Ian has talked you through them around the project that are on IFS and the appendices. Um, this is what a project costs that you need to complete, um, the, looking at a, at a completed form. Uh, this is all online on the Innovation Funding Service. Um, this is the early metric survey. Um, these are the questions that are asked, gen- generally speaking. There's, there's quite a lot of questions, but they boil down to these six things plus your business financials. These are the financials that we want you to submit to us. So showing historic information over the past three years if you have them, um, and forecast information that cover the period of your loan. Core balance sheet, in, uh, profit and loss information, turnover, by the way, grants are not turnover. Um, they're other income. Turnover is that nice money you get from customers. Um, sorry, I'm being rude. Uh, your EBITDA, your profitability, your operating profit, earnings before interest, tax depreciation and amortization. Key elements of your balance sheet, fixed assets, current assets, current liabilities, your capital position um, is really important. And then cash flow forecast as well going forward. We want to see ideally that those actually add up, that they balance, that the cash figure here in the balance sheet is the same as the cash figure in the cash flow forecast. I think we're all in the credit team, or they in the credit team and me, a member of the credit committee, getting a little fed up of seeing completely different things that don't connect. Please, please, please get a good financial person to help you with this if you don't, if that's not your core capability. If your management team is currently lacking that, please get outside resource to help you because if you can't fill in this right, it makes us worried that actually you're not a real business. You're just still a technology project that's sort of wanting to become a business. Please show that you're a real business that can cope not just with a really well-articulated innovation project, um, but also that can show that you're a suitable business that's thought about whether you should take on a loan, whether you should even apply for a loan, let alone whether we should consider offering a loan to you. Um, We've had lots of questions. So... I promised um, I'd show the thing about timing. No, really, this, this is a real live competition. This bar here is uh, the 20, 28th of March, 2018, at 10 o'clock. So in the last two hours, almost everybody applied. Um, and most of those actually were in the last 10 minutes. Um, so we say it every single time. Everybody always laughs. We always laugh. But please um, note that deadline. Um, we all do it, um, but please, please. Um, and the final thing, please read the instructions. And if you're in any doubt, please ask for help. Please do it through the credit support team in Swindon. Sorry, not the credit, the customer support service team in Swindon. They'll log your call. They'll hunt me down. Um, they'll make sure that we get a good, solid, reliable answer to you rather than, um, I don't know, 
direct mail on Twitter or sending me a LinkedIn message, which I sometimes forget to reply to, particularly the LinkedIn messages. I'm not very good on those. Um, if it's a detailed, complex, all sorts of yikesy sort of question, give us plenty of notice, go through the customer team, and happy to have a conference call, I'm happy to wrap in folks from the credit team if it's appropriate. But we won't write your application for you, we won't tell you how to decide how to manage your business, um, that's for you to do, but we'll do our utmost to clarify where we haven't made things clear. And, and just the final thing is, I'm assuming, because this is an Innovate UK sponsored event, that you're really good at, and clever at techie stuff. So you probably have a really strong technology development strategy. I hope, that because you're thinking that this is an innovation loan, that you're thinking, and because you're good business people and you're entrepreneurial, that you have a strong commercialization strategy or that you know how you're going to develop that. Your funding strategy needs to underpin those. And an innovation loan, I hope, for the right people, may be a solid plank of that, commercial, of that funding strategy to support your technology development strategy and your commercialization strategy. If it is, then I really hope that we can lend to you so that you can grow as a business because that's what drives the economic growth for the UK that Innovate UK, Innovate UK is there to support. So thank you very much indeed um, for listening. The slides will be made available through the KTN. There's loads of slides with the gory details. Please read the online guidance as well. Um, and um, look forward to seeing loads of really um, high quality, suitable um, applications from uh, people here. And thank you very much indeed to the people online um, for your questions as well. And I hope it's been useful. Now we're going to have some lunch outside. Um, 